Okay. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, very good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to welcome you all back to uh, this uh, International OBE Symposium 2022. Uh, just to remind everyone that the theme for this year's OBE Symposium, symposium is non-conventional teaching and learning activities in engineering education from OBE perspective. So now we are starting our uh, second technical session. Uh, and, uh, and the chair for this session is Dr. Zaki, Dr. Zaki Yamani, Ibn Zakaria. Uh, and before I hand over to Dr. Zaki, I would like to just take a few, maybe one minute to quickly introduce Dr. Zaki, and then I, I, I leave the platform for him, inshallah. Okay, so uh, Dr. Zaki is a chemical engineer. Uh, he worked uh, in the industry for some time as a project and chemical engineer. This is uh, during the time from 2003 to 2005. And then he also worked as a process engineer from 2005 to 2008. Uh, then around that time, he moved to academia. Uh, he joined the, the School of Chemical and Energy Engineering at the Faculty of Engineering University Technology Malaysia, or better known as UTM. Uh, he was a fellow, or he was appointed as a research fellow under the Center of Engineering Education in 2019. And later on, he has become the director of this same center. So now, uh, up to this point, now he's serving as a director of the Center of Engineering Education at the University of Technology Malaysia. Uh, his education background started uh, in UK. He studied and, and got his first degree from the University of Bradford in UK. Uh, then he got his master and PhD degrees both from University, University of Technology Malaysia, UTM. He is very active in research. His research area uh, interesting uh, he's, he is interested in uh, engineering educa education, catalytic reaction, engineering, safety, health, and environment. He has supervised a uh, yeah, good number of students. He has got good publication record, including uh, publishing his own book in chemical engineering. He's also uh, got uh, professional recognition. So he is listed as a professional engineer under the Board of Engineers Malaysia. He is a chartered engineer from UK. Uh, he is also uh, awarded a professional technologist title by the Malaysian Board of uh, Technologists. And he received also a number of, uh, of awards uh, either individually or working with his team in UTM. Uh, in the area of, of engineering education, he is very active and he's particularly interested in active learning, cooperative learning, and problem-based learning. And he has been doing a lot of activities related to engineering education, including giving and sharing knowledge uh, in talks like the one that, uh, yeah, like that, like, uh, yeah, different talks and, and, and knowledge sharings. He also mentored a number of lecturers. He participated uh, and organized a number of trainings and workshops. Uh, he, he is also an editor in the Journal of Engineering Education. He is a member of the Society of Engineering Education Malaysia. He participated also in the Safety uh, Champion in Engineering Education. Uh, fellowship program, which was organized by the Royal Academy of Engineering in the UK. Uh, yeah, and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So he is very active in, in this area of engineering education. So he has got uh, the, the, the experience, has got the, the, the knowledge uh, about engineering education. Uh, I think that, that that's all from my side. And um, now I would like to hand over to Dr. Zaki to take uh, yeah, to to take care of this session as as a chair of the session. 
it's up to you, the president. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Aminur, Rash uh, Aminur Rahman. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala sayyidina Muhammad al-Ashrafil Anbiya wal Mursalin Thank you very much for inviting me as uh, the session chair for this technical session number two uh, I'm going to be the technical uh, the, the technical session chair for four wonderful speakers uh, but before that please uh, be reminded that I am currently on the move I'm in a vehicle uh, so if there is any line problem i'm very very sorry okay so uh but i'm going to introduce the first speaker now okay uh for the, for every speaker you will be allocated 30 minutes and there will be 10 minutes uh question and answers uh and uh now we are going to have a very wonderful wonderful first speaker his name is dr riaz muhammad from mechanical engineering department college of engineering university of bahrain before i pass the session to dr riaz uh, I'm going to read a little bit biography of him. Dr. Riaz Muhammad is working as an assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, University of Bahrain. Bahrain. He received his PhD in design and manufacturing from Loughborough University, UK. He has more than 10 years of industrial research and teaching experience and supervised more than 15 postgraduate students. He has published more than 50 journals and conference publication and one book chapter. His research activities uh, include finite element modeling, hybrid machining process, industry 4.0, product design and development, composite polymers and biomaterials. Dr. Riaz is going to present a wonderful topic titled Application of UK PSF Dimensions in Engineering Education. Okay, without further ado, uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Rias. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Zaki, and uh, special thanks to Professor Dr. Uh, 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 Mazrul Islam and uh, obviously Dr. Uh, Al Sheikh for giving me this opportunity and uh, bringing you know different experts from different part of the world on a single platform uh, in order to share their experiences. Uh, Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zaki, for an excellent introduction. And uh, being a faculty member, uh, obviously, I'm involved uh, uh, in different quality uh, activities in the department or at college level. I'm representing a quality committee uh, at undergrade and postgraduate level, uh, at departmental and college level. And uh, being a part of it, obviously, you have to be, uh, you have to come up with uh, certain initiatives in order to uh, in order to uh, inspire the students or making learning happen uh, in the in the working environment so uh, the title uh, that i have selected for this uh, symposium is application of uk psf dimension in engineering education while joining university of bahrain i got an opportunity to apply for associate fellowship of uh, 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 advanced he higher education uk and uh, while doing so, uh, I have been exposed to different, uh, uh, you know, workshops, uh, training sessions, and reading materials that I got from the university. And uh, after going through those activities, those reading materials, uh, I certainly applied, you know, uh, some activities in my pedagogy, and certainly it's improved the learning environment, uh, the learning uh, process of students significantly. So I will share those experiences with you. Uh, before starting the lecture, uh, the layout of my presentation is a brief intro to UKPSF and Advanced HE, because uh, without UKPSF uh, framework, it is really hard to understand what I have done or what people are doing across the globe uh, in order to make learning happens uh, uh, in schools or even in, in higher education. So then uh, the second thing I have to discuss UKPSF dimensions. Uh, then plan activities and my professional practices that I adopted for getting uh, associate fellowship uh, of HE, uh, advanced HE or UKPSF. And obviously, you know, uh, and then I will uh, share some conclusions, okay? So let's uh, move to the first part, which is called advanced HE. So advanced HE works with individual or even with institutes in higher education across the globe. 
And uh, their main mandate is to provide excellent learning uh, experiences uh, to students and faculty member. Uh, uh, this is why uh, in order to implement, you know, their, 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 their goals, their objectives, Advanced HE okay. has a certain framework, which is called UK Professional Standard Framework, UK PSF. And uh, it is globally recognized and used for benchmarking of successes uh, which people have adopted at different institutes at individual or you know at organizational level uh, so far more than 125 programs have been accredited by uh, uk psf or advanced he uh, till 2021 and more than 150000 staff members have been uh, recognized through different fellowships by UKPSF framework. So this is the overall, you know, mandate of advanced HE and UKPSF. Uh, obviously the UKPSF, the framework, which is adopted globally for benchmarking or for uh, practice purposes, it has three pillars, okay? Being a faculty member, being, being, being part of the academia, you are asked to introduce certain activities in your pedagogy in order to support learning. So the first pillar is, uh, you know, activities or area of activities that you are introducing, uh, you know, in your pedagogy. So this is the first pillar, which is very important. And the activities can be ranging from, from, from minor to major changes that you are bringing in your pedagogy. And again, you know, you can take help from, 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 from published literatures. You can come up with certain novel ideas. And you know you can you can implement them in your pedagogy in order to making learning happens in the class. Uh, of course, whenever you are planning any activity, it's mean that you have to implement that activity by having some core knowledge of uh, 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 of the basic requirements of that activity that need to be incorporated in a class. And as I mentioned earlier. Uh, during this phase, we have been exposed to different workshops, uh, training sessions, even we have individual sessions with our mentors. Uh, they were uh, associate fellows or senior fellows of Advanced HE, and uh, they have trained us. And in addition to that, two books, uh, you know, which I would like to mention, one of them is already mentioned by uh, Professor Zafar Islam, uh, Muslim Islam, sorry. Uh, uh, which is uh, uh, Biggs and John, uh, John and Biggs book, okay, which is very important. And uh, it has all the basic, uh, you know, prerequisite requirement for improving your pedagogy. The second books was from Phil Reyes, uh, Making Learning Happens in Higher Educations. So these were the two books that I have read uh, during, uh, during this one uh, year, uh, uh, one year of a uh, period. And it certainly, you know, changed my, my, my teaching, uh, my teaching uh, methodology. Once you are, you have the core knowledge, then obviously you must have a, a professional values uh, that individual perform these activities uh, should exemplify. Okay, so it's mean these are the three pillars. Okay, it's mean you have to introduce activities in your teaching uh, methodology. You must have to link those uh, activities with the core knowledge as well as with professional values. And if you want to further, you know, elaborate those, uh, you know, three pillars, those three pillars have been further uh, subcategorized into subdomains, like, you know, in the area of activities, you can come up with the design and plan learning activities or program of study. So this can be any activity related to the first uh, subcategory, you can come up with any idea, any, any thinking, and you can certainly implement it. Once you, 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 are, you are making, you know, you are, you are making a, a plan to introduce any activity in your pedagogy, it means that activity should be linked with core knowledge as well as with activity, okay? But let's go one by one through these activities. And later on, you know, uh, I will share my experiences, uh, how I have linked those activities with, with core knowledge and activities, okay? So the first activity, which is design and plan learning activity, the second activity can be related to teach and support learning environment. The third activity can be assess and give feedback to learners. The fourth activity can be develop effective learning environment and approaches to student support and, uh, you know, you can say uh, uh, sub, uh, support and guidance. Okay, so again, any activity, any generalized activity, which being, uh, being part of the academia, you think that it can make certain changes that it can that, that it can make certain change 
uh, in the learning process of students, you can come up with that idea and you can certainly execute it in your class. Engage in CPD in, in subject and their pedagogy, incorporating research scholarship and evaluation of professional practices. Okay, so this is again the last part of uh, the area of activities that you can implement in your pedagogy. Regarding the core knowledge, okay, let's discuss them one by one and then I will share my experiences, okay. So regarding the core knowledge, the first part is the subject material, okay. It means that you are introducing an activity which certainly enhance, you know, the subject material knowledge of a student. Then, you know, the second part is appropriate method for teaching, learning and assessing in the subject area and at the level of academic program. Uh, the third level of knowledge is how students learn both gen uh, generally and within their subject area. The fourth knowledge area is the use and value of appropriate learning technologies. Fifth area is a method for evaluating the effectiveness of teaching. And the sixth area is the implication of quality assurance and quality enhancement for academic and professional practices focus on teaching, okay? So these are the six subcategories of core knowledge. And obviously, you know, we have uh, some professional values as well. So regarding the professional values, respect individual learners and diverse learning commitments. So this is part one, okay? Then, you know, regarding uh, the second professional values, promote participation in higher education and quality of opportunities for learner. And again, the third level is use evidence-informed approach and outcomes from research scholarship and CPD. And the fourth level is acknowledge the wider context in which higher education operates, recognize, and implication for the professional practices. So these are the three pillars. And you know, uh, like you can say activities, you have core knowledge and professional values. And under each pillars, we have subcategories. So being a professional uh, of academia, what you need to do, you have to come up with certain activities, okay? You can come up with certain activities based on uh, your, your, your experiences, based on uh, the literature that you are reading, based on trainings that you are receiving. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can plan or design any activities and certainly you can link it with any UKPSF dimensions in terms of core knowledge and professional values. And the main thing is that UKPSF or HE Advance mainly focus on reflection. Whenever you are introducing an activity, how it is reflecting on a student's or your learner. So reflection is important, okay? And uh, that's why whenever I plan to introduce any activity in a class, uh, what I did, I tried my best to link it with the student learning outcomes. I continuously seek feedback from students and based on their feedback, you know, uh, we, we assess the success of each activity at different level, okay? So now I will share my experiences, okay? Uh, I will share uh, some of the activities that I have introduced, uh, you know, especially in 2020, 20, 2021. Uh, the year was affected by pandemic COVID-19. So obviously we suddenly switched to online education and some of the hurdles that we were facing in online education were faced by every academy, uh, you know, uh, every, uh, every, every individual in the academia. And certainly, you know, people have come up with some uh, brilliant ideas in order to make assessment fear and making learning happens, uh, you know, uh, 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 in online assessments or online teaching. So uh, the first activity, okay, regarding activity one is design and plan learning activities. Okay, this is the first part of, a, uh, 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 of the UKPSF, uh, you know, uh, activities. So in this activities, I actually introduced three activities, okay? The first one was I have designed a course on failure analysis, okay? Because the first part is design and plan learning activities program of study, okay? So this was one of the requirement because in Bahrain industry, most of the engineers are doing maintenance work or they are facing certain failure analysis. So this was one of the requirement based on feedback that I received from different stakeholders. It was um, one of the main requirement of our alumni or employers. So what I did, I came up with this idea, why not to design a course on failure analysis 
and certainly you know we can we can target this particular area so a course was introduced i developed this course it was approved from all stakeholders it was discussed with the industrial and the student and you know all uh, all stakeholders they approved it and you know i designed this course and i'm now teaching this course for the last three semesters so so this was one of the thing obviously you know in terms of uh, knowledge uh, it was the subject material which was requested by you know by some of the alumni and even some of our uh, you know PEC member industrial advisory board members and i can link it to respect individual learning and diverse learning commitment v1 okay there is no restriction you can even uh, link each activity with multiple core knowledge as well as with multiple uh, you know uh, uh, professional values but it depends on the type of activities that you are introducing uh, and you are teaching pedagogy okay in order to teach uh, in order to make things simple so what i did i just link it with individual you know individual uh, sub pillar of ukpsf dimension and make it easy for myself right now we are working to 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 to, to develop correlation between these different uh, uh, subdomains of UKPSF dimension uh, through different implementation. Okay, uh, even you know not only in, in engineering, but we are also working in some other sciences colleges as well. So this was the first activity. Okay, and uh, regarding the material that you can see. Okay, this was the course uh, of Salibai that I have introduced. Okay, it is available with me. If anyone is interested, I can share you know the material with him as well. So this is the course material. And obviously, you know, after introducing the course, after, you know, offering it for the first time, I have to seek feedback from my students. So a simple, you know, survey questions was initiated. And this is the reflection, okay? The first question was, the course was organized in a manner that helped me understand an underlying concept. And 80% students said yes. 80% satisfaction level was achieved in this, uh, you know, in the first question. The course gave me the confidence to do more advanced work in a subject. 100%, which was really encouraging. Uh, the assessment covered so far, uh, project measured my knowledge of the course material, so almost 90% feedback, satisfaction level was achieved. Okay, I believe that what I am being asked to learn in this course is important. Yes, again, 90%. And I would highly recommend this course to other students, 100%. Uh, this semester, I'm offering this course you know, the, the, the upper limit is 20 students. So far I got 29 and still, you know, I have 10 students in a queue, but you know, uh, it's a very interesting course. Uh, students are liking it and it's really encouraging for me. Okay. So this was the first activity. The second activity that I have planned in this domain is silo designing for MENG 475. MENG 475 is design of mechanical systems. Okay, I'm really sorry, I'm using abbreviation, okay. So this is a uh, design of mechanical system. I was offering this course and uh, the, the, the issue was, the issue was that the silos were very generic. They were overlapping with one another when I joined the department. So what I did, I just, you know, revised the silos, discuss it with the academic committee and other stakeholders and they approved it. So, you know, uh, I just, uh, applied. these were the previous silos. Okay. And if you can see, you know, we are following EBIT. So previously, you know, EBIT has A to I, you know, program learning outcomes. And uh, nowadays, you know, they have revised, they have made it seven. So once they made it seven, I got this chance to revise the silos as well. So these were the previous silos. Okay, what I did, I just make it three, apply Bloom's taxonomy, and, you know, I just link it with, with the first uh, three uh, student outcomes, okay? And I incorporated, uh, you know, uh, communication uh, skills as well, because this is one of the requirement which we are, we, which we were getting from a different, you know, uh, different indirect assessment tools. So this was, you know, the activities, which was highly appreciated. And even, you know, uh, in the first uh, year when I offered this course, more than 80% students achieved the silos report, okay? So the results were quite encouraging. The third activities is workshop on fine art element technique, because most of my courses are mechanics of material, a design one, a design two, or dynamics, statics, failure analysis, product design and development. These are the courses that, I have, uh, that I'm offering in the department. So obviously, you know, I need my students to have finite element simulation uh, skills with them. 
So what I did, I organized, you know, a, a series of workshops for my students on finite element simulation. And, uh, you know, this activities has been linked with K4. Uh, K4 is the use and value of appropriate learning technologies, okay? Because simulation is a kind of a learning technologies that you can use in order to analyze any problem. And I can link it with V2, promote participation in higher education and quality of opportunities for learner. Because if you have FES skills, that's mean you can perform better, uh, you know, in, in any of the industry. <coughs> sorry and uh, the, the you know the sample of one of the workshop that i have arranged for my students is computational fluid dynamics because in failure analysis and especially in bearing design analysis you need computational fluid dynamics as well so this was one of the course okay in total i have arranged eight workshop or uh, eight workshops in, in one year uh, academic uh, duration and we started from basic concepts to structural analysis and transient analysis. And also, you know, one part was computational fluid dynamics as well. So this was, you know, the workshops that I have arranged for my students. And obviously, you know, the main thing is you are seeking, you know, feedback from students. Whenever I introduce any activities, I, uh, you know, simply make a poll, I put it, uh, you know, at the end of a class or in the end of a session. And you can see the satisfaction level of students that I got for, for some of the workshops, okay? So again, you know, uh, they have rated from one to five, like at scale. And you can see that, you know, the achievement was almost 100%, about three or equal to three in most of the questions. So this was the satisfaction level. And uh, very proudly, uh, you know, I, I would, I would uh, really proudly saying that uh, most of the students who graduated, you know, through this uh, duration, most of them are employed. And, uh, you know, you can say 95% of, of them are employed because I was uh, checking, you know, the alumni survey data. I contacted them one by one. And uh, most of the students who, who did these uh, courses with me because they were uh, equipped with finite element simulation skills. Uh, they were very good, to be honest, because I got some really interesting results and, uh, you know, some of them are in process for publication. So, you know, uh, most of them uh, got a job uh, even in Bahrain or, you know, in, in GCC region. So 95% of them are, are employed. So this is the success that you can expect being a faculty member. Okay, the second type of activity is teach and support learning, okay? So the first thing is working in small groups, okay? This was the first activity and I can link it with how students learn both generally and within their subject area, K3 level. And I can link it, link it with V1, respect individual learner because some of the students, okay, they are very good. They are very good to learn, you know, in, in group discussions, okay? Some of them are very good even to learn, to, to learn during a class. So this was one of the requirements. I uh, divided the class into small groups. I assigned them uh, some projects. Uh, even, you know, I assigned them some tests and group forms, uh, an open-ended uh, book, uh, you know, an open book exams. And they did, you know, uh, uh, the exams in small groups. Uh, uh, they recorded uh, the, the, the sessions of their discussions, which were provided to me. Uh, I analyzed it and based on their feedback, I graded them. So that was a very good experience, okay? Even I use the same technique. I use the same technique in class, uh, uh, you know, in class timing as well, because whenever you want to, uh, to, to do some activities uh, to students, so you can split them into groups and, you know, you assign them some topics, they will discuss it later on, you know, you can come up and they can present it in front of their class fellows. So certainly, you know, it was very good for some of the students because uh, the, the, the learning process was quick and some of the students were getting too much knowledge, you know, in these kind of activities. You know, this was, a, you know, a generic survey that I have generated for one of the course, which was uh, design of machine, machine elements, okay? Uh, this is a, a 300 level course. And you can see that working in group level has, you know, the satisfaction level was about 90%. So this was, you know, uh, a class size of 25 to 20, you know, 30. These, these were the class uh, sizes uh, at that time. So the uh, almost, you can say 95% students have participated in this survey. And this is the response level that I have achieved, which is about, you know, very good because it is excellent. It is about 90 person. So I would say it is, uh, uh, you know, very much satisfied. 
Now, uh, the second activity that I introduce is graphical and visual tools. Okay, so this is again very important, and I think you know these things. I got it from Professor Dr. Nasir, and I think you know Dr. Mazrul Islam will know these things very well. Okay, uh, I used uh, uh, Autodesk for CAD modeling and animation. Okay, so there were some excellent animations that I have included in my courses regarding different topics. Uh, these were taken from one of the mechanics of material modules, which is available online. I got it from Professor Dr. Nasir, thanks to him that he provided it to me. Uh, so these are some of the animation tools, even, you know, now we have, nowadays we have some virtual tools, virtual labs are available. So I'm practicing them, uh, you know, in my courses and it's certainly enhancing, you know, the student learning outcomes. And regarding, you know, the animation or graphical or visual tools that I've used, uh, you can say the satisfaction level was more than 85%, okay? Again, this was from one of the course, okay? I have data for all the courses for this particular uh, for this particular period, but in one of the course, the satisfaction level was 85%, more than 85%, and I think it's more than enough to give you a feeling that whatever you are doing, uh, whatever you are doing, it certainly, you know, reflect on a students. Again, we have a demonstration to dig digital ink, okay? As I mentioned earlier, that uh, most of these activities were introduced in COVID-19, uh, you know, uh, 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 duration. So the, the, the first thing that I did is, uh, you know, I, I, got, I, I was reading one of, the, uh, one of the research paper and I came to know that, you know, interactive, uh, you know, uh, learning can, can enhance, you know, the learning process of a student. So the first thing that I did, you know, on the first day of COVID-19 semester, I went to a shop and I bought, you know, a, a, a touch screen based device for my lecturing, okay? So again, you know, I introduced it, uh, I, I got, you know, one of the tool, I used it and uh, certainly, you know, uh, you will, you will, you will, uh, you will like it that, uh, uh, this is the response. 100% students were very much happy because I'm, I was mainly targeting design courses and in design courses, too much calculations are involved. And if you are teaching online, you know, it will be really hard for you to communicate the tutorial sessions to, to, to your students. So these things really help me. And even, you know, in design, sometimes you are doing three, three dimensional problems. So you know, this uh, uh, digital ink stylus based learning techniques helped me a lot in order to understand uh, the problem easily to my students. And you can see the satisfaction level was quite high. Okay, so this was the second activity. Okay, regarding the third activity is assess and give feedback to learner. Any activity which is related to these, uh, to, to, to this topic, uh, you know, you can introduce it in your class, okay? What I introduce, I introduce some at you feedback analysis, okay? Because we have format you as well as uh, uh, some at you feedback, okay? So what I did, I actually introduced a format you feedback. I'm really sorry, okay? it's a spell mistake. It's format you feedback that I have introduced in one of my course. And in this course, what I did, I actually assigned, you know, course project to my students and they have submitted their initial report, okay? Uh, I assigned some marks with certain comments section-wise. You can see those comments over here. And I, you know, give back that report to my students again in order to work on a particular area, especially, you know, uh, the CAD modeling, inventor analysis, uh, even in calculation, you know, the marks was very low. So I requested my students to sit again, okay? Record the session for me and you know, just uh, rework on a project again in order to make it better. And once they did it, okay, they resubmit uh, the file and this was the total marks that they got out of 40. So their marks were significantly improved. This is called for Matthew feedback, okay? And even, you know, I, um, I applied this concept in some of the assessments like assignments, lab reports, or even in one of the tests. What I did, I gave them open book paper and I asked the students, you know, to improve their solution, you know, through various interval of time, because I gave them one week time and they improved their solution. And certainly, you know, I revised the marks because through formative uh, as, uh, assessments or formative feedback, you can certainly enhance, you know, the learning outcome of your students. So this was the first thing, okay? And again, <clears throat> 
whenever I, uh, you look to the feedback that I received, you know, the feedback was more than, you know, 80 and 90% approximately, 90% in most of the question that I have asked regarding the formative assessment, okay? Even I introduced uh, two more things, uh, which was really good, okay? Uh, regarding uh, uh, regarding uh, this uh, formative assessment. I graded, you know, I graded student, uh, uh, students, uh, uh, assist, uh, students' uh, papers from students, okay? I, I graded uh, through students and uh, it certainly improved, you know, uh, their learning, uh, uh, outcome and their learning experiences because students can learn from each other quite easily. And this is the main thing, okay? The second activity that I introduce in this criteria is research-based assignments, okay? Uh, especially in failure analysis of 471 course, what I did, I actually introduced a research-based assi research assignments. Uh, we have made, you know, uh, a current signature uh, machine that can be used for bearing analysis. And uh, I provide that machine to all my students. What they did, they actually uh, use that machine in order to investigate the failure analysis of Deering's. Uh, and uh, it was a very nice experience uh, for, for most of the students. And this is the response that I got from my students. Okay, and nowadays, you know, two of the students are still working on their project in order to make it publishable. Uh, presentation, again, you know, this was the third activity based on PEG, uh, you know, from industrial advisory board, as well as from a student advisory board, we were continuously getting this feedback that communication skills for students are weak. So what I did, I introduced project in most of my courses, and I link it with, uh, with project presentations. So it is a normal practice that at the end of every semester, I have to take uh, oral presentation from my students. So these are a few samples of oral presentations uh, of some of the students. And this is the achievement of silos uh, and number of students uh, in this particular course, which is 375, by the way, design one course, okay? So again, uh, this is now a regular practice in most of my courses and uh, I'm using it for, for enhancing communication skill of my students, okay? So again, this is the uh, third activity in A3 area. Now in A4, develop effective learning environment and approaches to student support uh, the guidance, okay? So this is uh, the A4 area. And in this area, I have introduced one-to-one -one interaction because some of the students are very good to get the required level of knowledge in class, but some students require special attention. You, you have to sit with them. They are slow learner, they are shy in class, but they can be very relaxed and very effective whenever they are communicating with you through one-to-one -one interaction. So what I did, I opened this window for my students. I asked them, okay, you can share any problem with me on Microsoft Team or even WhatsApp or even through my email because it was uh, you know, a semester affected by COVID. They were not allowed to visit the university. So some of the students, they have shared their uh, problems with me on one-to-one -one interaction, okay? and I've responded them accordingly, okay? This is the calling history of that particular uh, period with some of the students, okay? Even with some of the faculty members as well, okay? But, you know, this, 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 this window was mainly open for students in order, to, in order to, uh, to help them understand the required level of knowledge which they needed in particular subject, okay? So uh, this was, uh, this was uh, you know, uh, again, you know, some of the questions that I got on WhatsApp, you can see, some of the students have asked complicated questions. I just draw a free body diagram, solve it, solve it for them, and then you know send uh, the reply through WhatsApp. So all platforms were available with them, and now you can see that their feedback was uh, you know almost ninety four percent. Okay, uh, satisfaction level was achieved with one to one interaction. Students were very much happy with the the way that we uh, we execute thing in a nice way, and they were they were satisfied with this one-to-one -one interaction uh, with, 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 with students. So this is, this is you know, the thing that you can implement, okay? Then we have a round table discussion, which is again, uh, you know, one of the idea that you can bring in your classes. Uh, round table discussion, you can assign any topic to students within a group. And by the way, you know, we are using Microsoft Team and Blackboard. This option is available, you know, in both tools. 
to split a class into groups, assign them some topics. You can join the discussion from time to time. And in this way, you can enhance, you know, the learning outcomes of, uh, of a students. So this was regularly practiced, uh, you know, in all the courses that I was taking in this particular time. And even, you know, after that, you know, this is now a, a normal routine because I'm practicing it, you know, uh, at least, you know, in one of my lecture per week and the result is really amazing, okay? This is the satisfaction level. This is the satisfaction level, which is almost about 90% in most of the cases. Uh, students really like it because Sometimes, you know, even, even the language barrier, because most of our students are speaking Arabic well, you know, they are good, but, you know, that not that much efficient in English. So sometimes, you know, they are, they are shy to ask questions. They are shy to share their experiences. But within a group, you know, there are limited students and uh, I allow them to even speak an Arabic language. So uh, they are using different uh, languages, okay, in order to explain concepts and things to one another. And it certainly helped them. You know, uh, it certainly helped them to understand all the basic requirements for knowledge uh, that that they needed. Okay. <clears throat> so again, this is one of the approach. Again, you know, I got this idea from 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 one of the published literature, and that's why I linked it with use evidence informed approaches and outcomes that uh, you are getting from research scholarship and CPD. So I got it from one of the published. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, ideas, uh, you know, in literature, I implemented and the result was really amazing. Okay, and activity five, okay, the first thing that I did is peer observation of teaching, okay, this was introduced for the first time with this, uh, you know, uh, advanced ECHI, and now we, we made it a regular part of our teaching, you know, methodology, because every faculty member need to do POT after you know, at least once in two year time. So this is now a compulsory part of our uh, professional uh, responsibilities. So what I did, you know, I, uh, I, I went through this peer observation of teaching. I got some great comments from my mentor, from, from, from my mentor. And the first thing, you know, because the semester was affected, you know, so I was delivering my lecture while turning off my camera. So this was one thing. And while most students in discussion, increase the time for discussion. So these were the three, you know, areas which were suggested by, by my peer to, uh, to, to improve it. And after that, you know, I made it compulsory in order to make the camera, you know, uh, on all the time during my lecture. This was the first thing. And the second thing is that, uh, you know, uh, how, would you rate the conversation and session with student in a course? So these are the responses, you know, most of the students were very happy because after peer observation of teaching, what I did, I actually increased class discussion times, okay? I introduced, you know, working in small groups, one-to-one -one interaction, these things significantly increased and you can see the output. The output was really amazing. Students liked this idea and their learning was significantly uh, improved. Okay, so this was the activity that uh, I actually introduced it, uh, you know, in this uh, A5 area. Okay, then ETVT workshop. Uh, Professor Gilly, uh, one of the renowned name, uh, name in the ETVT, you know, or you can say for online learning. So I attended one of her workshop and uh, based on her workshop, okay, uh, that was based on ETVT learning. So I introduced one of the ETVT, which is for knowledge construction in one of the course. And uh, the course, you know, the, the, the project was, uh, was given to students based on automatic transmission system of Toyota vehicle. So I, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I made a small videos on YouTube. I shared it with students and then students use this knowledge, this video, in order to uh, in order to, to to implement it in the uh, course project, okay. The result the result was really amazing. Student liked this, this idea, and you can see this was the response of ETVT, okay. Approximately eighty percent satisfaction level was achieved with this ETVT, okay, and that was really amazing. Uh, then you know the last activity that I introduce uh, uh, you know during this time period for A5 area is MATLAB application in senior design project because I attended one of the workshop with MATLAB okay and this was the workshop title 
I learned something from there and later on, you know, I just onboard some of my students and uh, they developed, you know, this uh, six degree of freedom robotic arm in your senior design project. Okay, it's still, you know, uh, under the way because we are in now in phase two, we are working on the path optimization of this robotic arm. And, you know, certainly it will be ready for further commercialization and, you know, publication purposes. Uh, so, you know, these are the various activities that I have introduced uh, during this time of period, okay, and in nutshell, if I want to conclude my work, I would say that the application of UK PSF dimension significantly improve my teaching uh, capabilities, okay, and it certainly enhanced student learning outcomes. So this was, you know, obviously happened, you, you saw it from the student response. The reflective analysis was very good because you are reflecting on your, you know, uh, 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 reflecting on the results and based on it, you can certainly, you know, come up with certain improvement plans and you can incorporate them in your pedagogy in order to bring some changes in your teaching, okay? And uh, certainly, you know, uh, in some of the courses, the results were really amazing. Uh, as I told you that one of the page who took all those workshops, uh, workshops on finite element analysis, the employment uh, ratio, you know, I'm now collecting those information, okay? It's almost 95%. So this is really amazing. It's given me satisfaction level. Uh, that's all from my side, okay? Thank you so much for being with me and, uh, you know, for being patient. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Zakai. Any questions? You are always welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Riaz, for your, I think it's a very interesting uh, talk. Um, unfortunately, we are running out of time. And then uh, I also have listed my own questions. But I believe uh, those who have questions, you can uh, message, private message, or ask the, your question to Dr. Riaz. I'm very, very sorry, Dr. Riaz, because of time condition. Uh, we have to skip that part, okay? So, yeah. but 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 then is uh, thank you very much for your uh, very enriching uh, talk and experience. I do also want to contact you after this uh, regarding your 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 presentation. Inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. inshallah. Anytime, anytime. Okay, you are all yeah, yeah. So I I I I uh, I want to say thank you very much, and I'm sorry I I need to skip the question and answer, but I I'm I'm urging the others to ask questions to. Dr. Riaz, okay, through the chat. All right, so I, I'm moving on to the second speaker now. Uh, the second speaker is Dr. Al Sheikh Muhammad Ahmad Al Sheikh from University of Kuala Lumpur, Uni KL, Malaysia. Uh, before I before that, let me just read uh, his uh, brief biography. Dr. Al Sheikh Muhammad Ahmad Al Sheikh is a senior lecturer at University of Kuala Lumpur, British Malaysia Institute. He received his Bachelor in Electrical and Electronic Engineering from University of Khartoum in 2001 and his Master and PhD from University of Hull and University College London in 2005 and 2010, respectively. He worked as a telecommunication engineer before moving to academia in 2014. Alshay's main area of interest is information and communication theory. His current project is related to relay channels in wireless communication systems. He is also passionate about engineering education and conducts study in the area. He is actively engaged in quality assurance activities and serve as program coordinator for two years. Uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Al Sheh to deliver his topic titled Metacognition in Engineering Education a case study. I hope, uh, Dr. Asher, you can uh, present within 30 minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Over to you, Dr. Asher. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Zaki. Yes, I, I try my best, inshallah, to uh, finish in 30 minutes. Yeah, inshallah. Uh, okay, so uh, I would like to thank again, uh, Prof. Mashar, for giving us this opportunity to share knowledge and experience. And it's a really a uh, good chance. Uh, yeah, in, in, you know, life is, is always busy. So we need to force ourselves to, to spend this time and share this valuable knowledge together. Shall we? So my talk is about metacognition in engineering education. And I will be uh, sharing my experience for one particular course. I take that as a case study. 
Uh, my talk is not too long, inshallah. I would like to give an introduction first, uh, just to, to share with you the, the challenge that uh, I, I, I think that metacognition can, can help deal with that challenge. I will introduce metacognition and we'll also share, you know, the third item is, is a, maybe it will take most of the time. I will share, I will share some of the, the, the strategies that I follow to apply metacognition in teaching uh, this course. And uh, finally, inshallah, I will just share some conclusion notes uh, before uh, opening the floor for questions and answers. Okay, so, uh, Normally, when we, we are teaching students in our classes, our vision is that they, they will come, they will one day become experts. They will be called experts. So what do we mean by expert? When, when a person is called expert in, in any area, in any prof professionalism, and even in, in life, when, when someone is become expert in one thing, what we mean by that, the, maybe the one way to explain this is to look into the problems this person faces and how he deals with the problems. Most of the time, we face what we call routine problems or easy problems or not complex problems. I would say this is 70% of the time, maybe more than that. Uh, so this is what we face every day from the time we wake up to the time we go back, uh, we go to bed. And normally for the, for an expert, these kind of problems are easy dealt with. So it doesn't take much time, it doesn't take much effort and energy, it doesn't take much of the thinking to deal with these problems. So routine problems, you know, normally we deal with them even without thinking much. You can, you can have many examples, you know, uh, cooking, uh, shaving our beards, uh, maybe make model and praying, and so on. Uh, even at the professional level, if you if you take uh, teaching, for example, maybe after spending some time in, in uh, teaching students, after some years, you know, teaching become a kind of, of a routine. Maybe not hundred percent routine, but most of the time, most of the classes we teach uh, without much. Uh, you know, conscious effort to make decisions and to solve problems and so on. We also face complex problems uh, in all different aspects of life, whether it's professional or personal. But even for complex problems, normally experts are very efficient in dealing with complex problems. So they are they are confident in, in dealing with these problems. They, they don't feel the panic, for example. Uh, they have a good framework for dealing with the problems, even if they didn't uh, face this kind of, pro of problem before, but it's still the framework most of the time will, uh, will help them to solve the problem. They have the abilities and the tool to analyze problem in a very effective way. And they also have the ability and the tools to analyze the solution that they will come with to deal with the problem and they can reflect in their solution they can judge their solution they can make good decision whether this is a good solution or not and they can also look for alternative solutions if the solution is not a good one before even applying that, that solution this is what we call an expert so uh like i said the the the, the main problem is dealing with the, with the complex problems uh and and when we say complex problems in engineering, we have we have good definition of what we mean by by complex problem. Most of the time, they will be multidisciplinary problems. They will be poorly defined. They will have, they will have conflict of requirements. They have many factors that can also be conflicting, and so on and so forth. So we we can yeah we have number of criteria that can uh, we can apply to identify complex problems. And this kind of complex problems, they also require special qualities to, de to deal with. So if you want to deal with complex problems, you have to be creative. You have to have good attention to details and you have to be very comfortable dealing with the details. You don't get lost there. 
you should be able to use mixed methods. So for example, if you take engineering, as an engineer, you have to be able to use analytical method, experimental, experimental methods. Uh, you have to be or have the background in many different aspects, you know, the commercial side, uh, the, you know, the, the, the political side, the society, and so on and so forth. Uh, you have to have very good understanding of the problem and also the solution proposed to solve the problem. And you have to have a, a good tendency to check all the time on your work. This is something that is most of the time like lacking in students. They just want to get to the end. They, are, they, they always rush to get to the, to, to the end of the problem. They don't look back to see what they are doing and whether that is uh, an effective way to solve the problem or not. But for the expert, he will be doing that unconsciously all the time. Every time he does one step in, in solving the problem, he will look back and see and check whether he's in the right way to solve the problem or not. So these are some of the, the, the qualities that are required in an expert. OK, so when we have the, the students in our classes, can we instill these qualities on them so can we, can we claim that by the time they graduate, they become experts? Can we claim that they have enough creativity? Can we say that they, they, they give good attention to details? They are comfortable using different methods. They have very good understanding of the, of the problems that they will face in the future in their engineering discipline. The answer definitely is no. And practically, this is, cannot be cannot be achieved. So why we cannot do that? Because first of all, we, you know, practically we cannot do this in four or five years that the students spend uh, to get the, their degrees. Normally the range of topics that we have to cover and the range of skills and attitude that we have to share with them is very wide and the approach is mainly to expose to expose them to the to the to experience and to expose them to the knowledge rather than making them experts in that in that area of knowledge this is one one, one, one challenge uh, when we are teaching our students and preparing them for for the future job the other challenge is that different students have has got different learning styles and i think Many people talk about this. Uh, it's not only learning styles, but even the culture, the background, uh, the gender. Uh, there are so many factors about the student, which makes it very difficult to create one consistent experience, learning experience that will lead to uh, you know, like a kind of guaranteed outcome at the end. So if you are um, if you are you design your, your lesson in one way, it will serve number of students, but it might not fit with some other students. Normally, when we design the lesson and when we design the course, we try our best uh, to design them in a way that most of the of the students in the class benefit from that experience and learn something from the class and from the course. Uh, another challenge is that. Uh, the, 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 the curriculum that we are teaching in our programs is designed to focus more on the theory. Yes, we have labs, we have design courses, we have research courses, uh, we even teach them about ethics, we try to teach them about the soft skills that they require, like communication, writing reports, and so on. But the emphasis in our courses is more on the theory. And that makes it very difficult, again, to, to prepare them for the practical life and you know, making sure that they will, they will become the experts uh, that we, we are hoping uh, they, they, they will be in the future. So, so then, should we give up? Of course, no. Uh, what we can do is to make sure that during the time that the students spend with us, 
like the, the four or five years that they are engaged in our engineering programs, even if we cannot make them experts, we make sure that they are equipped with the skills that will make sure even after they graduate, they evolve, they improve, they, they continue to learn, and then hopefully, inshallah, one day, maybe in a frame of five to 10 years, they become the experts that we we are uh, we are having we want them to be okay so how will metacognition help us to achieve that that uh, that objective uh, maybe first I, I should introduce or uh, tell you what exactly is metacognition for those who are not familiar with the term uh, there are different definitions that I met uh, and I found about uh, metacognition, but this is just one I share from the Wikipedia. So metacognition is the thought processes and an understanding of the patterns behind them. Okay, this is like a formal definition. In short, we can also say that metacognition is the science that uh, or the, is the science about thinking about thinking. Okay to understand the thinking process, to reflect on one's way of thinking and to know when and how one particular way of thinking will, will work in solving one, a specific kind of problem. Okay, so this is metacognition. So metacognition is, is about thinking. The term itself is being used first time, uh, maybe around 1970s, uh, by a scientist called Flavel, okay, that, that, that the first time that the, the term being used, but the word related to metacognition goes, uh, you know, long time back in the history, even, you know, about 300 BC or something around, the, around that time. So that means thinking about thinking, trying to understand human thinking is, is not a new thing, uh, and uh, yeah, and there's a good research and there's a good body of knowledge that study thinking, uh, the human thinking and how, how, how that human thinking works. There are two main elements of metacognition according to this definition. Uh, let me... So one element is the knowledge about cognition or the knowledge about thinking, understanding how the thinking work. And the second element is the regulation of thinking, meaning that how to use the, uh, the, our understanding about thinking in applying more systematic thinking to solve problems. So understanding thinking and then using thinking uh, our, our understanding of thinking to solve problems. These are the two elements of meta metacognition. When it comes to teaching and learning, these elements or these components doubles because here in the learning process, we have, we have two, two elements here. Now we have the lecturer and we have the student. Okay, so one element then of metacognition in education is for the lecturer to understand the student thinking or the student cognition and also for the lectures to regulate the student condition meaning that guiding the students to use their abilities the th their thinking abilities uh, in a certain way to to solve problems okay so this is from the lecture side of view from the student side of view, we would like also to have the student understand their own way of thinking. So it's not only us understanding that, but we, we want the student also to understand their, their, their own way of thinking and also how they can regulate their thinking so that they apply this successfully in solving problems. This is, if, if we can achieve that, this is a major step in you know, increasing the chances for the students to become one day experts, okay? So if they can control, if they can understand and control their think, thinking process, then that will help them to become experts in the future. Uh, number three and number four specifically are related to outcome-based education and to student-centered learning, because we want to shift some of the responsibility of 
learning to the students. So it's not only us putting the effort, trying to understand their thinking, but they also have to, to be in charge of that task and try to understand their own thinking. Uh, metacognition is not alone in creating that, 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 that kind of expert. In fact, uh, there are a number of other skills. Uh, one of them is automaticity, which means that uh, dealing with the simple and easy problems in, in, an, in, a, in a less conscious way. Okay, uh, Like I said before, most of the experts will deal with routine problems in, in an easy way. Sometimes our students will struggle even with the easy problems, either because they are not confident or because, because they are always suspicious or because they cannot even classify problems uh, so that they, they, they know which problem is a complex problem and which problem is a simple problem. So that automaticity is also uh, one issue that we, we need to look at. Self-efficacy efficacy is another thing and self-efficacy is the confidence of the student or the expert, okay, uh, the self-confidence that he is or she is able to deal with the problem that we have at hand. Uh, this is especially a problem when the person is faced with a new problem. The expert, like I said before, even is facing the problem first time and even if the problem is complex, but he has got the confidence that he has got the tools to analyze, to understand, and to propose a solution to that problem. So that self-efficacy is also important. And for, uh, the last skill is the problem classification. This is also another important skill. All the three, together with the metacognition, they, they are the building blocks of, the, of an expert. And normally, the, 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 the the measures or the tools that we use to teach any of these four might also lead to one of the other three. Uh, and there's a good overlap between the, the four of them. So achieving, for example, self-efficacy will help with automaticity. Automaticity, automaticity also help with metacognition and vice versa. Uh, so that's why I, need, I, I needed to list all of them together here. OK. so. Then what are the strategies? What are the things that we can do in our classes to make sure that the, the students employ metacognition and you know, improve their chances in becoming experts in, in the future? Uh, the course that I'm taking here as a, as a, as a case, uh, I will share you know, the, some of the measures and some, some of the tools I use in this course is a course in electromagnetic theory. And for those who are familiar with electromagnetic theory, this is a course, uh, this is a fundamental course, and it's full of theories, and it's full of, of mathematics. Uh, it's, you know, a kind of course that we teach in early semesters for electrical engineers. Uh, yeah, it gives a good background about electricity, trying to, to to make the student understand some of the fundamental concepts. You know, it has got less relationship to practice and it has got more relationship to the, to, to the theory. Uh, so normally from my experience, I have been teaching this course for a good time and I had taught it in three or four different universities. So the attitude to, toward this course of electromagnetic theory, uh, you know, the student, they kind not they kind of not falling in love with, with electromagnetic theory because of the nature of the course itself. You know, it's, it's not a, a very kind, exciting kind of course, I would say. Uh, so then, in my opinion, uh, the, the metacognition for this kind of courses is very helpful. And in my case, I find that metacognition has helped me a lot in uh, changing that. Uh, you know that that. Uh, relationship between the student and the course of electromagnetic theory. For my current uh, course, I have this list of uh, course learning outcomes. Uh, we have four of them, but only one and two are more relevant to the, the theory of, of electromagnetic because this course is also has got uh, an element of entrepreneurship. Uh, you can see market, industry, uh, and so on. So this is 
uh, learning outcome three and four. So learning out outcome three and four are less relevant to my presentation today. And the focus is more on learning outcome one and two, where we have to deal with the theory, the complex theory of electrostatic fields and magnetic field, static magnetic field as well. And, and here we are applying vector analysis and vector calculus. And, you know, like I said, uh, there's a great deal uh, of mathematics in, included in this course. Okay, so uh, here I have some some of the uh, some of the, the the techniques and some of the strategies that I follow, especially when we are you know dealing with problems and you know how to to understand how to absorb the problem in the right way and how uh, to successfully get to a solution to that problem. Uh, the, the first strategy that, that I use is to try to make the problem solving experience as real as as much as possible uh, to make it a real experience. Uh, meaning that if you just show the problem in the class and very smoothly present the solution of the problem from beginning to end in a very short time and showing the step you know smoothly going from step one to step two up to the last step to get the final answer that is not a very good experience for the students okay uh, one thing i do uh, i know it's a, it's a bit risky and i face the embarrassment sometimes is that when i go into the class i i don't take the solution of the examples with me so meaning that in the class just to show that uh, real experience, I have to face the examples similar to, to the students, as if I'm seeing the examples first time. I know that I have been teaching the, the, the course for many semesters, several semesters, but still, you know, going there without the solution will put you in a similar position as the student. Okay, so that means the discussion, the, the expressions, and many of the things that I will do in the class while solving the problem will somehow reflect the real experience of solving complex problems. That means I will make mistakes, I will get to dead end sometimes, sometimes I forget the, the, the formula to solve the problem and so on and so forth. So all these experiences that the students will, will face we I share with them, I try to put myself in the same uh, experience so that you know, it, it, that way they will, be, they will become more comfortable when they are facing the same, the same situation. So that means if they are uh, solving the similar, similar problems and if they get to that end, for example, the, they will not be embarrassed, they will not feel the panic, they will still be able to face that situation and try to get to understand the problem and, and get to the solution. So this is important to, to have real experience. Uh, applying problem classification is also very helpful in, in uh, dealing with complex problems. So let, let me share with you some of the slides, for example, I have in my class. So for example, here, um, introducing one of the theories or one of the uh, concepts, this is electromagnetic force, and this is related to the, the theory of Faraday. So you can see, you know, even before I discuss the, 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 the theory and what is this formula and what it means, you can see on the top of the slide, I, I take them back to the classification of the fields. Uh, the, the, the concept of the field is very fundamental in electromagnetic theory. And to deal with, with the concept of fields, it's very good uh, to understand the classification of fields. So fields can be classified in a number of ways. So we, can, we have uniform fields, non-uniform fields. We have time variant fields and time invariant fields. We have vector fields, we have scalar fields. Uh, so these are the three main different ways to classify fields. So even before starting discussing the, this new topic or this new theory, I remind them about the classification of fields so that then when we come to the formula, because this classification uh, will lead to some consequences on how to deal with different type of fields when we try to apply the formula 
year that invented by, by uh, Faraday. So after, after showing the classification, after discussing the theory and, and trying to, to uh, clarify everything about the, the theory, then we discuss the consequence of, uh, of the classification on solving problems. So for example, here, you can see here, uh, this is another concept of, of finding the total charge. So we have different uh, type of distribution. We have uniform distribution of charge and non-uniform distribution of charge. Although the, the, the concept of finding the total charge is, is, is the same, there's no difference. But when we apply that concept to different type of charge distribution, we end up having different ways to solve problems related to charge distribution. So for example, in uniform, in the uniform case, it's just a simple multiplication of charge density by either the length or the surface area of the flow or the volume of that charge. But if we have non-uniform charge distribution, then the solution is, is, is different and it's based on doing integration uh, over the, the again, the, the charge density, whether it's a line charge density, surface charge density, or volume charge density. And then after that comes an example. And like in this problem here, which is trying to, to calculate, for example, the, the, the total charge given some charge distribution. So normally the first step we do is that we try to do the classification of the problem, whether the question or the field that we have here or the distribution of the chart, is it uniform or non-uniform? Okay, here we have two questions. One of them is uniform, none of them is non-uniform. And then based on that, we decide what is the best way to deal with this kind of problem. So classification then is very important. Uh, it's very good to, 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 to discuss different approaches to solve the problem, even if, it, if not all of them are valid. Uh, thinking has to be loud all the time, even if you feel, uh, if you feel lost in the classroom. Uh, you know, like I said before, you know, when I go without the problem solution, I have that experience, I get lost, I don't remember how to solve this problem. So I think loudly and I ask, I even ask the students sometimes to help me get to the solution of that problem. So that kind of loud thinking is also very helpful. No embarrassment uh, from making mistakes. I do that all the time. And that again will make the student feel more comfortable with making mistakes. And they will, they will understand that mistakes is part of our human nature. And that will teach them that they, they also need to check on their work. They, they, you know, because if, if the lecturer who, is, who has been teaching this course for many years and who is supposed to be an expert, if he, can, if he is willing to make mistakes, then for the student is more than accept, acceptable to make mistakes when dealing with complex problems. Uh, we also reflect on the steps. You don't rush on presenting the solution. Every step, you have to make sure that the student understand the, 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 the wisdom behind that step, why we did this, but we didn't do that, and whether this step is a good step or not. And then when we get to the last answer, we still have to go back and reflect back on the different approaches because you know we, 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 just, we, we have alternatives, we have chosen one approach, we go back and, and check the other approaches, Will they also work or not? And if they don't work, why they don't work in solving this, this problem? So all this discussion and all this process, I think it's very helpful in, in helping with that, uh, with that process of dealing with, with complex problems. There are some other things that one can also do in, in, in the class. Uh, relating theory to practice, this is one thing which is also important. For example, here, you know, the clamp meter, the, the working principle of a clamp meter is based on of, uh, based on one of the famous theories. Uh, we call it Ampere's circuital uh, circuital law. So after discussing the law, just to show them, you know, these theories has some relevancy to the work that we do and to the to to to, to, to the work around us. It's not just uh, a theory that we study. Uh, this is another example of relating to, to practice. This is another problem from, it's not from electromagnetic theory, it's from other course. So again, here we have a problem that we have to solve. Uh, Dr. I'm sorry, you, your time is up, but uh, if you can, your 30 minutes is over, but you can try to 
to continue yes. and wrap. I, I okay. try to yeah, I try to conclude in, in two minutes or, or so. So in this example here, again, you know, after solving the problem, maybe you spend 10 minutes to, to solve the problem, but then you have this statement, what can we conclude from, from comparing answers? And that's another 10 minutes to discuss this problem and to reflect on the practical side of the problem that we have. Okay, so it's not only about getting uh, the numbers as a final answer for, for the for the for the example that we have. Comparing different approach and different lab techniques is another way. Even you can compare uh, things that they learned in previous courses with what they are learning in the new course. For example, my course has some relate, relationship to circuit theory. So relating electromagnetic theory, theory to circuit theory is also helpful. Uh, using active learning techniques mean that sometimes give the student the chance to solve problems by themselves. Either when a student come and present in the front of the class, you know, propose the solution or dividing the student into groups and ask them to discuss and try to solve the problem by, by themselves. Uh, yeah, so I, I, yeah, here we have a, more of these techniques, uh, creating positive experiences, meaning that if one is successful in, in answering uh, some question, you have to press that. You have to remind the, the other students about this student who, uh, that way we, we, we can create the, those positive experiences. And of course we have to avoid any negative experiences. Uh, avoid the mistake of shocking the students from the first class with very difficult theories. Start from easy to difficult. This is better approach than starting from difficult. I know some, some lecturers think that starting difficult is better, but this, in my opinion, this is not the right way to do that. Uh, don't use the speed as grading. We do that in final exam, but at least in some of the other set, uh, assessment, give the student times to solve problems. Uh, give them homework so that they, they, they work on their own best. This is also helpful. And also show non engineering aspects of, of the theories. Uh, I'd like to share the history of electromagnetic uh, theory with the students all these discoveries, they have very nice tales and stories that they will add some human dimension to what we are teaching in the class. And that will grab the attention of the students and make the course uh, less rigid uh, uh, compared with what uh, we do. There are some other strategies we are proposed in the literature. Uh, for example, we can use posted uh, rivers and questionnaires, uh, working with problem-based learning also, it thought to help with that uh, metacognition thing. Uh, teaching about the, the problem solving and the framework for problem solving is also another thing that the student need to learn. I didn't apply this, but I think there are good things to, to, to try and apply in the future. Some of the challenges, of course, are there. For example, the, the cultural barriers, getting the student to be engaged is not always easy. Uh, like I mentioned before, students are also diverse. So metacognition techniques might not work with all the students. And finally, we have a problem of time. You know, like, like I said, you know, we try not to make time as a, an assessment tool for, for, the, for, the, for the work. But of course, we, we are limited on time. And therefore, sometimes you have to rush. Sometimes we have to make uh, solve the, 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 the problems in the class in a shorter time so that we cover the most important thing that, that we need to cover. So in conclusion then, uh, you know, the, when we are teaching, we have to consider both the, the short-term and the long-term object, objectives. It's not only about learning things in our class and passing the final exam. We have to think 10 and 20 years after the student graduate. But metacognition can play an, an important role in achieving those long-term objectives. And we have number of approaches and number of strategies that we can follow. Uh, and we as lecturers, I think, and this is a challenge, we need to be more creative and look for many other different strategies. You know, the, 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 what I have shared here is, is these are the things that I, I found in the literature and these are the things I learned from one particular book I'll share with you now, but of course, definitely there are other techniques and other things that we can we can propose to help with metacognition. Okay, so I, I really owe it to this book, Teaching and Learning STEM. I know that 
some of uh, other presenters has has shared this book and uh, yeah i would like to, to 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 share it again and encourage everyone to get his copy of this book and this book was authored by our uh, chief guest today uh, professor richard uh, felder so thank you to thank you to uh, Prof. Felder for authoring this book i know he's not here today but hopefully inshallah maybe uh, yeah maybe we can we can yeah share that that gratitude to, with him in another in another way uh, another occasion inshallah uh, that's all from my, my from my side thank you very much everyone uh, thank you for your time and uh, yeah i'm i'm happy to take uh, any questions if uh, if there are some okay thank you very much uh, dr alshim How about a very uh, brilliant presentation from you about metacognition, thinking about thinking. So it's very interesting. And uh, Richard Felder is sleeping. It's 5 a.m. in his time. <laughs> Okay, we have four minutes uh, for question and answer for you. If there is any question from the floor, if there is any question, if there is any question, there, there's uh, four minutes left. If Professor Masarul, okay, yes. Professor Masarul, your yes. question, please. Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, thank you, Brother El Sheikh. <laughs> I mean, it was a challenge and you took it, and Alhamdulillah, you have applied metacognition, which is really very important. Now, I, I'm curious to know about the reaction you received from the students. I mean, this is the first time you tried this. So what sort of reactions, I mean, you received from them? Uh, okay, so uh, uh, one thing that I wanted to share, but maybe I can share now. Uh, like I said, uh, you know, the, the, the electromagnetic course has got a reputation, even since the time we were, we were students. Fortunately, I, I, somehow I became very interested in electromagnetic theory, but I, I know that it has got that bad reputation. So I, I don't, I didn't uh, like do like official questionnaire to see the, uh, the improvement of that reputation uh, with the student. Maybe I, I can do that in the future. But my, my personal observation, uh, I can compare the first semester I'm teaching the course and how that changes over time. One of the things that I discussed with the, with the student in the first class, I asked them about uh, what they know about electromagnetic theory, because we know that the students share experiences. So the senior students, will share their experiences with the, with the junior students who are taking the, the course first time. In fact, you will have the students consulting their seniors whether to take this course phase or that course phase and, and so on. And in, in most of the time, they are very honest in telling me that, for example, they are scared of the course or they, they don't have good, you know, uh, good idea or, yeah, when they are coming to the course, they, they, they think it's a challenging course. So then over time, I can see the change in that, that, that reputation. So after several uh, semesters, it becomes like, you know, when, when the students are coming to my class first time, you feel there's a kind of ease, you know, taking the electromagnetic course compared with the, with the first time I'm teaching the course uh, in, the, in the university, you know. So I, this, this is my, my observation. Like I said, maybe I still have to do uh, uh, a proper way, a proper of, uh, way of uh, to study and to analyze the, the improvement in, in that. Uh, but hopefully, this is something that they can do in the, in the future, inshallah. Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Alshe, for the answer from Professor, for the, from the question from Professor Masaru. I think uh, we, we, that's the, the only time that we have for the question and answer. <laughs> so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Al Sheikh, uh, for your time and presentation. Thank you. Uh, yeah, pleasure to have you. And now we'll move on to our third speaker. Okay, our third speaker is uh, I.R. Dr. Zamri Harun. Okay, 
IR Dr. Zamri Harun is from Department of Mechanical and Manufacturing Engineering UKM, Malaysia, University Kebangsaan Malaysia. Let me read a brief uh, biography of him. Zamri Harun is a senior fellow at the Department of Mechanical and Material Engineering, the National University of Malaysia or University Kebangsaan Malaysia, UKM. His early education was at the Sekolah Tunku Tuanku Abdul Rahman Star Ipoh, which is a very prestigious school. After spending approximately one year learning English and the American ways at Indiana University, Bloomington, India, uh, Indiana, the United States, ending uh, summer 1994, he pursued his engineering at the Rensselaer uh, Polytechnic Institute, Arpines, uh, in mechanical engineering, Magna Cum Laude, Magna Cum Laude. Okay, this is very excellent, okay, in 1987, and in master's engineering, uh, also in mechanical engineering in 1998, both from RPI. Uh, he has uh, quite a number of uh, practicing engineering experiences, such as uh, work at uh, working at Motorola Semiconductor Malaysia uh, from 1998 to 2002, as well as uh, he also joins a macro works in Yamrahat as project management construction in construction in 2002 as a mechanical engineer. In 2003, he joined Gerbang Perdana Yamrahat as a design engineer. Oh, okay. He has plenty of. Uh, uh, Yes, practicing uh, engineering experiences, so that's very good. In 2007, he joined UKM and mostly gave lectures for undergraduate courses at the department and a drastic change in 2008 where he moved to Melbourne, Australia to pursue his PhD uh, and he studied turbulence flow at the Walter Bassett Laboratory at University of Melbourne and finally graduated his uh, PhD. I believe somewhere in 2010, 11, something like that. Yeah, Dr. Zamri. Okay, so uh, without further ado, uh, uh, Dr. Zamri is going to deliver his talk uh, titled Teaching and Learning Activities to Promote Professional and Teamwork Skills. So uh, Dr. Zamri, you have 30 minutes. So that means uh, in Malaysia time, you should stop around 6.01 p.m. Okay, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Zaki, uh, thank you, Prof. Mahazaharul from Bangladesh and um, rest of the team, um, the Secretariat. I'm happy to deliver this talk again. Um, I, I joined this first talk uh, last year, so already one year, and cannot wait for this second session. Uh, is my voice okay at the moment? Doctor? Yes, yes, it's okay. Very, very clear. All right. Okay, okay so, excellent. So I have 30 minutes. Uh, I have 30 of a slide. That means I have to be a bit fast. Okay. Okay, um, I'm going to deliver a, a topic on teaching and learning activities to promote professional and teamwork skill. And actually, I just realized that that this is the title that I have to I have to deliver. And it was different than what I initially thought for like three months, four months, I already give the title to Prof. Mahzarul. And last Wednesday, I realized, uh oh, I have to collect a few things, okay? Because I have, I'm not prepared for professional and teamwork skill. Uh, good thing is that when I uh, get the data from my colleagues, okay? This is like a brand new presentation, I will show this before, because, you know, I just collected them uh, from all my friends, so I I show the names here. Uh, uh, Associate Professor I R Dr Rizaldin Ramli, Abdul Hazi Azman, and Dr Zalihah Wahid. So yep, uh, these are the colleagues. Um, so why is this uh, important? Uh, as a collective unit, workers lecturers are more efficient and productive than if they were to work as individuals. So that's why team is very important. Uh, important to prepare students for good theory and experience, okay, and prepare university and students for fierce competition. This is especially for the professional part. Um, so I am going to do case study basis, okay. I have given a talk on OBE, and we just now have uh, you know alignment with uh, uh, complex engineering uh, problem talk. Uh, very elaborate by one of the speakers. So I actually delivered that talk 
uh, one year ago and i think there is a need for me to you know to go uh, to another scale okay so i will i will share with you later uh, on four four cost uh, four case studies uh, why i do not go one by one with the story because you know um, i think i need to uh, give like real life example like especially when dr zaki give my you know background yeah i i have a bit of industrial uh, experience so that i think uh, be an opportunity to share with you so professional development is quite simply a means of supporting people in the workplace to understand more about environment in which they work the job they do and how to do it better it is ongoing process throughout uh, our working life okay and another point that i want to mention is that um for professional there is no program outcome there's no po on professional in chinton accord okay but for teamwork yes there is a, a po so i can get some um, uh, information from that okay this is the talk uh, from last year so i did quite elaborately when we align the calls co and then the po so we have this you know um po9 and then we have the uh, complex engineering activity or complex problem solving cpn and cea okay but i think this is not what i'm going to talk uh, this time around okay a study number one um our work with produa same like any public in malaysia we have this yearly or annual activity with Perodua, with Proton, these are the uh, automotive companies. Uh, they provide some uh, seed grants, like 30,000, 40,000, big in Malaysia, that's equivalent to about 10,000 uh, US dollar, and you know, design and build something. The thing is that this is not for like play. This is actually for real uh, application. So the last one was uh, to design a seat where under the seat we have some kind of box to be placed under the seat. So we have to, you know, like design and put the seat, the prototype for the seat. Seat is like, you know, uh, you are sitting on something. Uh, so um, we, have, you know, we have annual uh, uh, activities. So we have, you know, certain year we got something, certain year we got nothing. So that's that's normal. Okay, we can't, you know, you can't be forever winner or we can't be forever losers, right? Um, but the good thing is that in every year's uh, every year's event, we discuss with the top management of the design team from Perdua. So, for example, this is the guy I already forgot his name, and actually we open the real drawings. Okay, that means it's not like uh, you made some sketches and then you know you tell the student, okay, let's work on this. No, this is actually from real. Uh, you know, like maybe KC or Sacha and something like that. And this is the CEO of uh, Produa. And then uh, a little bit much earlier, okay, this is uh, also Produa Echo Challenge, okay, which is one of the uh, leading automotive uh, in Malaysia, leading automotive activity in Malaysia. We were to design some, uh, you know, we design something and then concept of this design is that it was lightweight, aerodynamic, more stable, good weight distribution, wider front vision, so on and so forth. And we didn't just, you know, put it on design. Okay? We actually built it and then uh, get some engine from somewhere, from actual uh, running a car, and then we put it to this car. Okay? Totally new chassis, and this car actually running, okay? and it's like a sport car. So, um, and then uh, recently, so why, why do I share all this uh, picture with you? Is that uh, this is important because we can tell the people out there that we are doing something in the automotive industry. So when we are doing that, then we have the downstream activities. Uh, we have uh, the government uh, actually selected us, actually not only UKM, UKM and UTM as the core university to uh, Champion the policy on remanufacturing industry, close engagement with the public authorities, road transport department, the OECD council, and circular economy. So, circular economy in Malaysia is 
not really like a new name, okay? This is something that the government has to do because there is a lot of business there. Okay, we are talking like billions of US dollars in a year, okay? In the next coming, uh, maybe five, 10 years, okay? And then we are doing end of life vehicle uh, policy. Uh, and then we are, uh, the drawing that I use here is used by fellow lecturer for application as professional engineer. So in Malaysia, we have this, you know, like chartered engineer equivalent to the UK. So we cannot go if we don't have like a professional engineer. So the picture here uh, is showing um, a machine in authorized automotive treatment facility. Okay. How do we name this? Uh, this is like between academics and the industry. Okay. Uh, we, uh, we do the ELV policy and then we ask uh, the scrapping uh, contractor to, uh, to, to comply with a certain um, like requirement and then this scrap yard, we call them with a, you know, like a special name, authorized automotive treatment facility and then we ask them to meet requirement requirement and uh, this meeting uh, was held like Two days ago, okay, uh, we held a meeting with Mari, Mara, which is Automotive Manufacturing Association, Government and Economy, to modernize scrapping vehicle and supplier, Comelco, the machine supplier. Um, why do they engage us? Because they need us as academics to convince the government. Okay, they cannot go to the government because the government is not going to believe them. Okay. To ask like people around the public to uh, hand over their car when the time is over. Okay, they need academics to tell the government. Okay, the government, please accept this policy. The policy is uh, like uh, developed and kind of designed by uh, the academics, the public, and some uh, government agency. So those are very important uh, for this one. Okay, so let me see this one. I got ten minutes, so maybe. Another two cases will uh, suffice a uh, 30 uh, minutes presentation. Uh, Robocon competition. Uh, one of, you know, like a very important event in Malaysia is Robocon. Um, it is an annual national level event organized by the Ministry of Higher Education. This competition aims to improve the knowledge of robotic technology among students of higher education institution while also give space to students to showcase their skill, innovation, and creativity in the field of creating robots. Robots. In addition, this activity fosters spirit of student cooperation and team to complete the project. Winners will go to national level. So that's the Robocon uh, logo or flyers. For year 2022, USF Penang has been selected to host this competition. And it was at uh, on a public channel, RTM, Radio Television Malaysia. Uh, okay, uh, Dr. Zaki, you remember who's the winner of uh, Robocon? <laughs> um, I have not. Okay, it's actually won by two teams from UTM. Yeah, uh, yeah, but I know, uh, I, know <laughs> I, I know the, the person in charge of UTM. <laughs> no, it was won by... UTM actually. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I, I know it was one by UTM. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but I, I, uh, but I, I, I am I am from the chemical engineering, so I don't really. Oh. Uh, uh, I see. I'm from the chemical engineering. Okay. I see. I see. Okay. 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 So congratulations. It was not long ago. It's like uh, April, April, May. Yeah. So. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Why I choose uh, Robocon as a uh, case study? Uh, there's something there. Um, of course. We are talking about IoT robots, uh, you know, IR 4.0 stuff like that. Okay, uh, and we cannot run away from this anymore. We go to Chinese university; their name is not conventional anymore. They are not like mechanical engineering, manufacturing engineering. Their name is more like you know, uh, center for uh, advanced machining and this and that. Okay, it's like already. Uh, integrated kind of department name okay? and they have like two departments, three departments that you don't know what really they are doing uh, by the name. So I'm saying that uh, we have to go further uh, rather than in our uh, discipline alone. So that is not really mechanical or electrical, but somehow in, in Malaysia, in I guess also in Bangladesh, uh, South uh, 
South Asia, we, we are going to stick this for another maybe 20 years, for example, because of maybe the conventional, because maybe we are uh, used to do it. Um, I'm saying is that uh, the need to uh, join our application or increase the participation between these two departments is very important. So not only this department, but also like in uh, chemical engineering. So chemical engineering, when we join with mechanical, then we have bio uh, technology or something like that. Yeah, very important. And uh, in Malaysia, there are not many some of things like that. So between the two, we managed to do a lot more things. Okay, like uh, for example, for the Robocon, we have the uh, mechanic portion of it. Uh, we have the spring and stuff like that. And for the uh, electrical side, we have the cooling, we have the control and stuff like that. Okay, we are not stopping there. We are proceeding. Okay, so recently, uh, of course, uh, we didn't do well. Okay, we are like uh, eight of, of 24 teams. So that's eight, okay, which is nowhere near to UDM. Uh, some snapshot from the event in last April. Um, what I'm saying is that after this event, like the same, uh, uh, the same people, okay, from electric and electronic, and some from um, uh, facil uh, faculty of economy, we joined together to submit a big grant for uh, palm oil industry, okay. And as you know, maybe maybe people outside of Malaysia and Indonesia do not know that we are having a big uh, problem in Malaysia which is there is no, we call it a labor crunch, labor crunch, okay? So there are no people who want to work with the uh, palm oil. So this is a picture of palm oil, okay? Um, somehow this become a very expensive crop in Malaysia, uh, very high yielding and very expensive. The problem is that nobody works uh, at the farm. So the palm oil, you see the red color and yellow color fruit, uh, like dates, okay? They uh, ripe and then nobody collect them. Okay? So it become like a waste. When it is a waste, okay, um, a lot of estimate mentioned that it becomes a one billion ringgit per year waste, and that's equivalent to two hundred fifty US dollar waste each month. Not talking about each year, each month. So big waste. So we join our team together, mechanical, electrical, and some. Uh, ergonomic uh, to submit a grant to uh, the company, uh, which is like the organ organization of palm oil in Malaysia, MPOB. Uh, so the mechanical, they are good with the mechanization and the electrical, they are good with the uh, control and stuff. And we submit something like that. This is the basis of uh, the Robocon. The Robocon has a similar thing. And then uh, we hope something like this, uh, give um, some benefit to the government and 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 we get students to uh, participate in this kind of uh, uh, grant preparation uh, uh, details. And case study number three, we have a course here that we designed um, to uh, basically appreciate the latest technology in uh, mechanical engineering. And actually it is not only focused in mechanical, but it can also be uh, related to mechanical engineering. So some of them are civil related, some of them are signal related. Okay. Uh, the objective of the course is sharing with students latest technology, collaboration with Petronas. Petronas is the uh, company for oil and gas and KTMB is the railway company. In work among lecturer, what are the skills um, you, you have developed? And I'm just copying from Richard Felder. Uh, technology rich active learning. Um, every semester, the team, team will plan a series of talks. It's intended that the team suitable with the course, the topic must be recent. And speaker is prominent in the field. Practically, the meaning of recent is related to pillar in industrial revolution 4.0 uh, World Sustainable Development Goal SDG. Richard Felder uh, mentioned about you know how uh, student experience uh, of our lecture. Okay, in the first week uh, we are looking like smiling, we are looking uh, good, we are looking ready at the start. But after weekend, uh, people got tired. 
uh, because anyway, they already know you. Uh, but I can see that this kind of course, okay, actually, I was here, okay, I introduced this course to the, to the program, okay. Um, with this kind of course, you can see that the student come, they never stop coming. Uh, because this class is like considered easy, okay. Uh, how can how can uh, how bad can can it be? Uh, there is some kind of final examination, but it will be easy. But uh, the thing that I want to mention is that uh, because the nature of the course is like very open, okay, new technology that that is that is not offered in textbook. So that's why you can see when the student come, they are smiling from like week one until the week maybe. 11 okay something like you know towards the end of the semester so i i am i am having a feeling that the student are uh paying a lot of extension to this kind of talk and they actually they produce credit from this some of the topics uh, as shown here uh, and the companies are from uh royal malaysian army from some uh, technology and one of them is from Proton. So Proton is the national automotive company. And I, I just mentioned about, I just mentioned about Perodua. So, you know, Malaysia like uh, produce maybe 200 to 300,000 um, uh, cars of our own. And one of the talk was delivered by Humbly Jig Group technical solution uh, from Petronas and Petronas is is uh, like world, world leading company. Some picture, some flyers. Um, Tan Chin Lo, uh, one of the company, he always like recommend the use of open source. Okay. So now we don't have to depend to Scilab anymore. Uh, so sorry, we don't we don't have to depend to MATLAB anymore. We can use um Scilab, MLM Scilab. We don't have to use like LCs anymore. We can use open form. LaTeX, for example, when I work with Prof Mazharul, we don't we don't use Microsoft Word anymore. We use uh some software okay, over Prof Mazharul was it over overlay okay overlay. I type here and he types over there and it's status is real time okay um, so things like that we recommend we ask the student to uh, you know take it up okay and Siemens will talk about technology and communication um, prof uh, sorry uh, IR humbly uh, Petronas is world leading company uh, 45,500 company and in 2022 it is 216 somewhere you know somewhere top okay and we appoint IR Hambali as our industrial advisory panel and we keep asking IR Hambali we have some student who needs uh, industrial attachment okay and he gave every every year he give like a 10 or something like that so we are thankful to this and we have talked on uh cyber threat okay uh if you don't know this type of this this region, Malaysia, Singapore, people have some money. This cyber crime loot these wealthy people millions and millions of dollars. Okay, every year. Okay, so every like week we see something like you know very very funny news. You know like teachers losing like half million ringgit, which is maybe equivalent to fifty dollar US. You know simply somebody managed to take them to use some apps in handphone. So that's that's becoming common. So we have we have talked to a student, and you know, hopefully the student they know how to uh, tackle this problem. Um, so when with Hambali, um, we ask Hambali um, to give you know something that can benefit to us. Okay, so we uh, we appoint him as one of our industrial advisory panel. So he participated in all of our talk. Uh, I mean the program structure discussion talk. So uh, in that sense, he can he can help us. So uh, we have applied for for grant with Petronas, and somehow Petronas was uh, very happy with us, and then they approved one of us 
uh, to you know to 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 get a drone monitoring to one of the oil and gas installation. And I think this is my this is my uh, case study number four. Uh, how much time do I have, uh, Dr. Zaki? I I think I, I can uh, summarize uh, this. You <laughs> have you have like uh, five, uh, several more minutes. Okay, that's good. I can then I can cover until this four. Uh, this is my last case, so I think I, I make it uh, in on time. Uh, so. Case four is uh, the, uh, regarding final year design project. Um, so we divide uh, the composition of the group. Unlike in, I think India or other South uh, Asian countries, uh, in Malaysia we have uh, Malay like me, like Dr. Zaki, and we have Chinese. Okay, where once you look at them, you know this is Chinese. Okay, and then we have Indian. Okay, uh, I think. My, my skin is a bit dark, okay? Um, so we have to make sure that these people are divided into like, you know, uh, not to the ethnic group, okay? So that, you know, we get the, 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 the maximum benefit of such a mix, okay? And we want to make sure that the male and the female are mixed, okay? And the CGPA of good student and not so good student, they are mixed, okay? Uh, we want to ensure that students learn not only technical skill but also soft skill. For example, how to get along with other people. So this is uh, part of the uh, intention of the talk, uh, anyway. Uh, and then um, we have some capstone project uh, talk just now. Okay. Uh, so in capstone, usually we have a choice of product. Uh, we have to come up with a replica or prototype. Students are assigned project criteria and themes. So explore and propose their own ideas conceptualization of design based on customer requirement. Uh, so the student have to do some survey, needs analysis uh, that, of course, they have to embody uh, the concept and then they come up with uh, detailed drawing. And after detailed drawing, they will have to uh, fabricate their prototype. So that's general uh, arrangement of uh, capstone. Okay, It should be the same with all university you know, they comply um Washington appointment so some picture of uh, the student uh, activities at the faculty so this one looks like there's a drone and this looks like okay this is uh, uh, like a energy collection at uh road okay so once the car once the car hit that uh, bump it will generate some kind of electricity and I just received a picture that this design has been used by Plus IV. Okay, so one of the students actually now proposing to Plus IV already graduated like in 2019, so already three years down the road, and he keep updating and updating his work. So that's good. <laughs> I didn't show his picture uh, because it was uh, a bit a bit funny. And this looks like a drone. Okay, this is like 2022, like uh, last June last June uh, presentation, okay? And I was here also, okay? Because I am one of the teacher in a uh, capstone project. Some other picture uh, for other projects. So in capstone study, we not only get the lecturers to mark our uh, report or our product, okay? We get the industrial um, engineers or industrial people and mark our report so that there is a close collaboration and we make it like a colloquium we call it a colloquium and this is a typical drawing each um, group has to come up with so i'm not like boasting like you know this is uh because you can see a lot of balloons in the picture actually this is a very typical drawing and this is the exact drawing that i would expect uh uh, professional engineer to submit when when they are prepared for the professional interview. So the exact like you know requirement for the students. So later when they are ready to prepare for the uh, professional engineer examination, then they are not you know like uh, they they will not say that they are not prepared for that. Uh, 
speech by uh, by uh, professional engineer and then the examiners are Proton, KTMB, Deloitte, Sapura and other company. Okay, uh, I want to wrap this up to say that we collected this title not only from outside. Okay, of course, we can come up with our, our site titles or the project focus, but we actually uh, like, you know, we recommend that the student come up with a uh, real engineering problem. Okay, so one of them, because we sell like real engineering problem, so it is it is easy to get the attention from the uh, from the uh, real business, okay? Because what we produce is not like for nothing. We produce for something. It's real engineering uh, issue. So Izad and Hanani made it to I think this is okay. The third place, okay? Uh, because we have some kind of tournament out there. So in conclusion. Uh, we want to inculcate, inculcate teamwork and we uh, get more for university in terms of grant, in terms of efficiency, in terms of ranking, in terms of student uh, employability, in terms of um, like money, okay, uh, income generation. Prepare staff and students for professional work and prepare students for competitive work. At the same time, university will get the attention of the public and the government. Engage students with industrial work. It will provide student and staff exposure and link to real issue and even business prospect. So to conclude this, uh, I think I am a little bit out of OBE, but I think uh, this is important because sooner or later, we have to prepare ourselves for the real thing, okay, not just simply OBE, like one of the uh, lecture, uh, speaker from Pakistan, right? Uh, so are we ready for that? Okay, uh, how much how much resources uh, are, we, are we putting and how much benefit we are getting? So we have to kind of balance uh, the real benefit that we're getting. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Zamri. Uh, that's a very, very nice uh, sharing indeed from you, uh, sharing your experiences uh, from all the various case studies. Uh, very interesting. I, I, I'm hoping to have a collaboration with you later in future. <laughs> Inshallah. Yes. Okay, anyway, uh, now we are open for the question and answer session. So uh, is there any questions that maybe anybody want to raise? Just you can raise your hand and then uh, switch on your mic and ask. We have we, now we have uh, like nine minutes for question and answer. If no, maybe I can start asking uh, ask a first question. Okay, Dr. Zamri, uh, when you conduct uh, some of the key study that is maybe perhaps in the class or uh, within your course, uh, what kind or how do you conduct the assessment? Uh, so that, okay. that's the question. Yeah. Actually, only two of the case study involve uh, actual class. Okay, uh, so the capstone or the FYDP or we can call it integrated project. Okay, and also the uh, recent trend in mechanical engineering. These are the actual classes. So uh, I wouldn't say that is much different from the rubric that we are having in UKM. UTM or even in a uh, Asanul University, uh, the rubric should be similar. Uh, so basically, we have the marks for the, for example, economic study, marks for concept, mark for embodiment, and marks for prototype. Something similar to that. Okay. Uh, so, so uh, maybe in summary, we have. Quite distributed, you know, like <clears throat> uh, marks for uh, maybe the prototype uh, has like big percentage, and this is like a design project, so design part also has a big percentage of mark. So for the other two, because they are just case study, so there is no like a rubric or marking scheme for that. Okay, thank you very much for the uh, enlightenment. Uh, maybe if if uh, I'm just trying to relate that if you uh, or your 
your your teaching and learning activities uh, can integrate together what uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Al Sheikh Muhammad just now did uh, something to do with meta cognitive. Uh, yeah. That would be very interesting. And then perhaps in future, if you have the opportunity, yeah, maybe you can uh, invite or uh, ask your student to do a reflection reflection journal. So that could be yeah. also interesting. Then from the reflection journal, many data can be captured and then you can write paper for that. <laughs> Yes, yes. I hope that can be done. Just a uh, joke, really. <laughs> Just a joke. Uh, the first time we talk about meta cognition, something, the colleague lecturers, okay, the colleague lecturers say, what? <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was the first reflection when we talk about meta cognition. But, uh, you know, uh, after that, we, we try, we have to embrace uh, all these uh, new uh, methodology. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, Thank you, Dr. Yeah, welcome. Is there any, maybe perhaps the second question for today? So we have uh, like four more minutes. Yeah, I, I have. Oh, a... Professor Masarul, yeah, Professor. Yes. Sorry, I didn't saw no, your it's... hand. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a question to Dr. Zambi. I mean, maybe, I mean, I'm just repeating. I mean, uh, you didn't conduct any kind of, I mean, uh, a survey which is capturing the reflections of the students um, before and after taking these. Um, projects, yeah, multidisciplinary projects. I mean, you got no, that? No, no, not for this one, uh, the student reflection. Uh, maybe one or two of the lecturers did, but not that I know the data is shared with me. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. But, yeah. but, mm -hmm. go, go ahead, Prof. No, in this regard, I mean, uh, I, I saw in the chat box, Dr. Zaki was suggesting the careers about gives reflective cycle. Yeah, I mean, I'm not I'm not at all familiar with this. If uh, Dr. Zaki can, I know he's very he has expertise he's in uh, engineering education center of UTM. So if you can very briefly give us some suggestion or any, I mean, uh, comments about gives reflective cycle, I think that will benefit us because we are conducting this type of survey that we are not. I mean, we don't have proper training to do this professionally. We en we engineer, especially in, in the engineering faculties. So I think we'll benefit from your suggestion, Dr. Zaki. So, so that, 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 that question is for me or for Dr. Zaki? <laughs> I, think, probably, I think it's probably for you. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I, I'll, I'll take, uh, I'll try to take one minute to answer that question. So uh, when we talk about Gibbs reflective cycle, so we when we have uh, when our students have projects, it's very good to ask them to write uh, reflection, uh, and then from uh, Gibbs reflective cycle, you can have five elements: first, the content; second, the analysis; third, the reflective thinking part; fifth, the evaluation; and number six is the feedback. So uh, I have conducted, uh, I have prepared a YouTube video to, to help my students understand this as well as other lecturers. Uh, maybe I can share it later with you guys, or maybe I can share it in the chat soon. Uh, so okay. that's basically it, okay? So uh, there, there are basically like more than 50 or maybe close to 100 theories regarding uh, reflection or reflective thinking uh, formulation uh, framework. So uh, what we are using in UTM now is uh, Gibbs reflective cycle. Okay, that's it. One minute. So okay. now, <laughs> thank you. Thank uh, okay. you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, uh, asking that. Okay, so uh, Dr. Zamri, I think that's the time that we have at the moment. I really uh, enjoyed uh, listening to your presentation just now. Uh, thank you. We'll meet soon. Okay, after this. Okay, so let's move on to the last speaker. Uh, so thank you very much again, Dr. Zamri. So the last Welcome. speaker we. Have yeah, we have uh, our last and final speaker, which is uh, Professor Dr. Lal Muhammad Baral. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, a little bit information about a brief biography about uh, Professor Lal uh, Mohan. Uh, he is an experienced educationist with over 18 years of teaching experience in providing the vision and teaching required to ensure a high quality of education for peoples, for students. He is committed and dedicated professional with a proven ability to teach, motivate, and direct students to maximize their performance by encouraging within a positive energetic environment. 
At present, Professor Baral is the head of textile engineering department at Asanul, Asanullah University of Science and Technology, Bangladesh. He did his PhD in engineering and management in 2014 from LBUS, Romania, and Master of Science in Textile and Clothing Engineering 2000, in 2003, and from Technical University, Dresden, Germany. Dr. Baral completed his Bachelor in Textile Technology in 19. Uh, 97 from Bangladesh University of Textiles. His research interests include textile manufacturing, process and quality control. Six Sigma, Six Sigma and knowledge management, sustainable curricular development for engineering education, problem-based and project-based learning, teaching learning method. So Dr. Baral has published a significant number of scientific papers and also served as reviewer in different reputable index journals. He also served as an editorial board member of International Journal of Quality Assurance in Engineering and Technology Education. In 2019, Prof. Baral organized an international scientific conference on sustainability of global garment industry in Bangladesh. Dr. Baral received the Best Professor Award in 2019 in Textile Engineering Studies from Bangladesh uh, of, sorry, Textile Engineering Studies of Bangladesh from World Education Congress, CMO Asia. So without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Professor uh, Baral to the stage uh, to deliver his, uh, his talk entitled Problem-Based and Project-Based Learning for Engineering Education and its Impact on OBE. Okay, over to you, Prof. Baral. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon, Honorable Session Chair. Dr. Jackie Amini bin Jakaria. Thank you very much for such a nice comments about me. And with your kind permission, I would like to share my screen. Yes, Prabhara, but we cannot see your face. Maybe it's missing there. I don't know about how about the others. Uh, <laughs> we see we only see the background. Missing the background, but no, no, the background is there, but your face is not there. Okay, let's see. Give me one minute, please. Okay. While Prof. Is it okay? Add, um, no. No, we are not seeing you. Um, maybe uh, any advice, uh, Prof. Mazharul? Can we just he proceed? Can, he can con I think that he has some issue with the virtual background. Ah, um, okay. So we can cancel the virtual background. Can I, can, I, can I suggest something? Can I, can I make a suggestion? Yes. Uh, if, if he can open the background effect. Can you open the settings, the background in the settings? Mm -hmm. I, uh, I already opened it. Okay, there's an option at the bottom say that I have a green screen. Yes. Uh, it should be unchecked. I think that okay. that, that make the effect. Ah, okay. Now, okay, now we can Is see. Is it okay? <laughs> yes, yes, good. Now, okay. Okay, now you can proceed. Uh, Prof. Barral, okay, you, you. Yes. You, you have 30 minutes from now. So that means... Uh, I hope you can take care of your time. Okay. Okay. Um, is my presentation is visible? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, good afternoon, everybody. Again. Uh, sorry. Is it okay? Yes. <clears throat> Actually, my presentation topic is problem-based and project-based learning for engineering education and its impact on outcome-based education. So <clears throat> I'm currently a professor of Department of Textile Engineering of OST. My uh, presentation outline, actually, I, <clears throat> at first, I will try to give a brief idea about problem-based teaching learning method. 
traditional and uh, give a brief idea about the traditional learning and the problem based learning what is the difference between two what is the characteristics of problem based learning and what is the philosophy of pbl teaching learning methods historical evolution of pbl and different uses of pbl in different domain of education especially the engineering university albert implemented pbl teaching model i will give a brief idea about the albert model and i will try to give the knowledge sharing platform uh, within the pbl activities later on uh, i will go for the outcome based education and graduate attributes and finally i will try to conclude with the impact of pbl on outcome based education so <clears throat> what is pbl actually pbl can be defined as an inquiry process undertaken by students that seeks to resolve questions and uncertainties about complex life situations here students learn from and build upon each other's questions are open to different points of view listen to and respect each other's ideas and work collaboratively towards problem resolutions and reasonable conclusions <clears throat> here i highlighted those keywords which is very important that means the students should work collaboratively and they have to find a solution for a real life problem which is very much ill structured with it uh with a group work say pbl actually uh it started long before in 1960s but popularized very much by barrows and tamlins in 1980 it is a, an inquiry based process of learning and a this learning system actually uses the problem scenario and encourages the student engagement to solve this problem finally here tutor acts as a facilitator not a uh, you know teacher just like traditional teacher and the tutor directed to the students to explore the task themselves and claim their present understanding examine their knowledge and skill gaps in order to decide the new information and skill they need to appropriately address the task and resolve the problem uh, regarding the traditional teaching method and also the pbl method what is the difference actually if we go for the traditional learning first the teachers actually give the information to the student and that the student need to know the student actually memorize this learning system that means this information and finally they have to given actually some problems to illustrate illustrate how this problem can be solved and use this memorized knowledge but in problem based learning it is bit different first the student has been given the problem that means the student has been assigned some problem and they have to identify what the need to solve this problem what knowledge they need and finally they are tasked to learn and apply this knowledge to solve this ill structured problem so this is this is the 
basic difference of traditional learning and problem-based learning. So there are a lot of characteristics here, PBL. It is also the real life situation that means based on the real life problem, which has have no right answer to organizing, focusing for learning. That means that this problem is ill structure. They have many way to solve. So this is one thing and a student work in a team to comfort the problem, identify learning gaps, develop viable solutions. The student gain new information through self-directed learning. And the staff acts as facilitator. This problem leads to development of judgment-based decision-making towards the problem solving. So that students or team should judge their work and go for the solution. The student's experience, learner's experience should be acknowledged. Student take responsibility for own learning. That means to solve this problem, they have to give in, they have to learn their own. And this learning system has also the uh, partially theoretical and also practice. That means it's together theoretical and practice. Theory should be learned by the students for their own and also they can be uh, take from the theoretical class and also the practice they have to do with their hands-on experience. And also this type of learning system focuses on process rather than product of knowledge acquisition. As I informed earlier, so tutors, they should act as if not uh, a teacher, but a facilitator. And this focus from assessment to outcomes to self-assessment and peer assessment, that means this type of uh, education system say student has the chance for their assessment, for their work assessment, they can assess self. Even this assessment can be done from the peer, that means the teammates. And through their activities, actually, the focus is going to be the communication and interpersonal skills of every team member. So those are the in general, all the components which include problem-based learning, where a student is there, where the facilitator is there, it should be collaborative learning, inquiry-based learning, communication skills. Yes, all those things should integrate it, the problem-based learning, which is very much required in 31st century graduates actually to do their work in a practical field. Now, if we go to the teaching mode of PBL, that means that in this system, helping students to become self-directed learning learners, facilitating the learning process, providing an opportunity to explore knowledge and understanding, learning from experience and providing providing formative and summative feedbacks. On the other hand, the learner, learning point of view, in problem-based learning, the learner actively constructs new knowledge because they have to solve the problem through theoretical knowledge and the practical knowledge, that means hand-on experience. So that means they are generating knowledge constructs the new knowledge. So this is very much necessary. It is a constructive rather than a respective process. It is an active process of finding out in which learning occurs by doing. That means what he has done with their own or the team members has done with their own, that is actually a learning process. So if we Go for the teaching and learning philosophy. The great philosopher Socrates, he actually mentioned 
I cannot teach anybody anything. I can only make them think. That means during learning, learning process, you should facilitate the students to, and encourage the students to think about the way of learning and the problem solving process. So problem-based learning is actually the method where a student can think properly and they should think and apply their knowledge for solving the problem. Uh, uh, if we go for the historical evolution of PBL in 1960s, actually in North American medical schools started first, then end of 1960s, the so renowned university, McMaster University of Canada, University of Limburg in Netherlands, Harvard University in US, they started this type of education system. Later on in Denmark, Roskilde and Alborg University, they started vigorously and even their all courses are designed through this problem-based learning method. In Germany, Bremen University, Australia, Newcastle University, and nowadays, all over the world, many more universities, they are practicing this problem-based learning system. Well, uh, from the literature, it can be seen that in every area of education domain, PBL is practicing the higher education in different domain, medicine, research education, nursing, engineering education, doctoral education, economics, in, even in basic science, chemistry, biology, physics, everywhere they are practicing this uh, teaching learning methods. Now, this is an overview of Albert PBL teaching model for engineering education, especially in different university has their different models, but Albert, established their own model that is widely used. So they started with the, you know, from the curricula, they divided two parts. One is say theoretical content and this content within this content, actually the thematic content will be taught and this content as usual in traditional system, student will be studied and also individual uh, assessed by the individual examinations. And beside that, actually that laboratory work, that should be also done. And within the laboratory work or practical work, there will be two parts. One is experimental activities that what we are doing in the lab and also one project. That project should be done uh, focusing on the real life problem where real life problem is going on. And this problem should be related with the thematic content, thematic topic from the end, this problem should be um, selected from the practical field. And this experimental activities and project work that should be uh, assessed by the group examination. And finally, the final evaluation would be done from the individual examination of each student and also group examination. Then the final evaluation and final grade should be um, assessment should be done. This is the basic model of for especially for the engineering education, which is uh, practicing in Alborg University, Denmark. Here, the course content for Alborg University, the thematic content will be the 50% of the total uh, marks and also the laboratory and uh, work will be the 50%. But in other model, maybe uh, other university, they, they customized it with their own and 
it can be varied according to the you know the national uh, rules and regulations even their accreditation policy and so on here the project especially the project work should be done very carefully and there are some steps to be taken for this project implementation what are the key activities of this project first the facilitator should build a team with the students to solve uh, to do a project then identify the course related problem from practical field to solve this problem actually detailing the parameter necessary to solve the problem encourage the student to brainstorm with teammates develop an action plan to achieve the timeline for the project and implement the action plan finally summarize their result with a written report and also the oral uh, presentation in front of evaluation committee so this is the steps where you can see there will be the team work and also it should be a real life problem student can brainstorm and uh, take their opinion everybody's opinion they have the parameters that means that they if they do the project timeline they have this project management skills even finally they are preparing the written reports even oral report that is that enhance their communication skill now if we are talking too much about our you know university industry relations within university industry relations link there can be a platform that is the knowledge management platform and where the pbl activities can be done within the all stakeholders if we see here university and industry they are linked each other from university faculty members will be the facilitator from industry the expert industry expert they will act as a mentors and with the student group they will be the in the middle or that means all those teams will say identify the real life problem from industry which will be also related to our content and also they will solve this problem through a research process researching process in this way a knowledge management platform can be developed where the faculty members can get knowledge from the industry expert faculty member can get the practical knowledge the industry expert can get also the theoretical knowledge from faculty members and the students actually they are getting knowledge or gaining knowledge from different way you know from the industry expert from the faculty members from the university perspective thematic content tradi traditional curricula and also from the industry that is real life problem how to solve and all those process can be done within a knowledge management platform where the problem based learning can be uh, main activities from this method actually the learner's achievement is learners is learning collaboratively which leads to the teamwork capability they can gain the communication skill also the interpersonal skills project management and research skill and <clears throat> their lifelong learning they are self self directed learning they are solving the problem that means through theoretical knowledge also practical knowledge and also uses some modern tools 
that means all those things they need and they have to apply it to solve this problem and those problem is also the real life problem where design development and solution is very much necessary now the outcome based education we everybody actually um, talking about the outcome based education and uh, several speakers they already mention about the outcome based education so this is an educational theory that bases is part of an educational system of goals and in outcome based education the faculty of a program reaches consensus on a set of program learning outcomes that is include actually knowledge skills and attitude so this knowledge skills and attitude it will be gained through a uh, systematic way of curriculum development that is every course outcomes program learning outcomes and also program educational objectives so this program learning outcomes especially it is um, you know decided by the accreditation agency that leads to the graduate attributes also so main target is to achieve through outcome based education the graduate graduate attributes determined by accreditation agency that means washington accord or in bangladesh perspective by it so and course outcomes it is also say based on the bloom's taxonomy that different levels of knowledge so to gain this knowledge actually bloom's taxonomy they uh, define three domain cognitive where mental skill and knowledge that is thematic content should be achieved my psych psychomotor where the physical skills and manual skills should be done and also the affective that is the feelings or emotion different types of emotion of the uh, students or graduate should be achieved so to achieve that goal they uh, define this 12 program educational objectives where the 1 to 5 that means the engineering knowledge problem analysis design development solution investigation modern tool uses that is relevant to the core engineering science that is the thematic content more and also the professional due diligence it includes the engineering and society environmental sustainability and ethics and finally the skill different types of interpersonal skill that is individual work teamwork communication project management and so on so main goal is to gain the engineering attributes according to the washington accord an engineer should gain the engineering knowledge problem solving skills design development solutions communication skills individual and teamwork skill investigation and research ability modern tool uses project management and finance the engineering society environment and sustainability lifelong learning and finally ethical knowledge so if we compare with the washington accords attributes even the learners achievement from problem based learning we can have a look say more or less all those dimensions students or graduates are achieving through their um, learning even uh, if we mention about the industry based integrated design project from ob curricular or finally a design project or capstone project industry training or work based learning even laboratory experiment all those courses which is actually the culminating courses that can be done properly very effectively through problem based and project based learning and that should be uh, relevant to the engineering complex engineering problem solving method so in that way 
I would like to conclude. Problem-based learning has the positive impact for enhancing the quality of engineering education. PBL has also the positive impact to implement OBE. Even PBL can help to achieve the required attributes of a graduate specified by Washington Accord, as we have seen. So uh, I got references from different uh, research papers. And thank you very much. Hopefully I am on time. Hello. Yes, yes you are on time, uh, Prof. Baral. So okay. very, very good timing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much for that uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, talk about uh, the differences between problem-based learning and also project-based learning, as well as its relation to OBE and so on. So now I would like to open the uh, question and answer session. So we have uh, 10 minutes for that. Anybody, if you are interested, you can raise your hand. Okay, I have one. Please, okay, one Dr. question Q &A. in Q&A. Uh, Dr. Ash Dr. El Sheikh uh, has a question, our repertoire for today. Yes, go ahead. Uh, Salam alaikum. Uh, uh, Mohan, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I just realized in one of the slides when you show the, the program outcomes and which one relate to BPL, um, if I'm not mistaken, you have excluded BO5, which is the use of modern tools. If, if you can go back to that slide. Uh, I, I just want to make sure that um, I have seen it correctly. So, because I'm, I'm surprised. I, I, I believe modern tools, uh, I think, yeah, it, it links, I think, very well. Uh, to this, this one or? The previous one, no, not, not that one. OK. It's a list of all the program outcomes. Uh, the, yeah, oh, OK. It was. No, no, it was there just a, a minute ago. It, um, okay, I think one of uh, maybe slide 14 or uh, you go up. Yeah, 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 this one, uh, 21, 21, yes. Uh, sorry. It, is, is, is BO5 included or is excluded? Uh, oh, it is also included, yeah, but. Uh, okay, so this, is, from this is one included. to five, it is included. That is okay, 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 uh, okay. within the core engineering science. Okay, okay, so we are in agreement there. Okay, okay, thank you very much for clarifying. It, it, it seems like the, the green box is not sufficiently, yeah, yeah. I thought, I thought it's included it, it, it really from the list. <laughs> okay, 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 and then the same thing for PO12. Yes, the okay. life of the yeah, yeah. PO8. Is that the question, also, but... There's a question. Yeah. Yeah, I, right. I think I, I think according to his answer, I think the all all, all BOs are relevant to BPL, right? All the twelve, I guess, right? Or uh, anyone excluded, Prof? Uh, yeah, actually, there are some um, issues where um, in PBL they have the the engineering and society, environment and sustainability and ethics. This type of work directly we have to include within our thematic content. And during our project, we have to include this type of you know, uh, pro program outcomes um, inside, inside our activities. You know? So for uh, environmental sustainability or ethics. So this is, um, should be the, that uh, PO6, PO7, and PO8 should be integrated with the problem-based learning also. And um, well, it, I hope you got, got the answer, right? Yeah, I, I think that answers my questions. Yes, thank you very much, Prof. Thank you. OK, OK, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Elche, for the question and also clarification that you requested. <clears throat> OK, we have, I, I checked the question and answer tab here. We have a question from Kazi Dawood Hafiz. Hafiz. OK, uh, I, I, okay, I'm going to read it. EBL seems to be a bit time consuming for assessing students' overall performance. And it might even create an environment where 
the learners might encounter a lack of prior knowledge. What is your reflection regarding these issues, uh, Professor uh, Baral? Well, yeah, I, I got the, got this question actually. Uh, this PBL actually uh, we implemented even in Alborg University in every courses they design such a way they um, go for the thematic content and also the practical uh, experiment even project in every courses within their duration of course so in every courses after the semester they should assess their students for for a specific course so it is not time consuming yes of course as the facilitator working uh, he should work very hard to direct the students and the manage the students to uh, get the outcome you know from this this project but the time should be within the semester duration not more than that okay so that's the answer prof baral yeah okay uh that's the answer for the uh question just now maybe i can add a little bit uh feedback from uh kazi Dawood. Uh, I think uh, sometimes it feels like it, it, it's time consuming, but if you work in a team of lecturers who formulate everything and manage everything together, that will feel a little bit lighter. You, 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 uh, you will not feel quite burdening. You, you, you feel uh, slightly easier than if you do it by yourself. So that's just, just a little bit information that I just add. <laughs> okay, any, any other question? We have like uh, maybe three, four minutes left before we can uh, wrap up everything. Any more questions? Okay, there's a question uh, about just now. Somebody requested for getting the presentation summary. So maybe the secretariat okay, can uh, manage this. There was a question for that. Uh, because uh, we have okay, okay. With very excellent slides presentation. So, it's interesting to have uh, the copy for it. Yes, okay, I can. Idea? I can send this slide to the secretary. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, Prof. Masaharun. Any other question? Please. Maybe last question. Okay. If no question, I maybe I will ask the final question. <laughs> Please, uh, Prof. Baral. Okay. Uh, you are from AUS, uh, AUST, yeah. Bangladesh. Um, uh, do you yourself uh, apply uh, problem-based learning in your courses and what kind of uh, problem-based learning problem, uh, what kind of problem that you uh, give to your students? Well, thank you. Thank you very much for this question. Actually, <clears throat> during uh, my PhD work, you know, in Romania, I applied this process within the, their uh, textile engineering department. And it was related to textile, um, related to problem from textile industry. That, that industry was, um, the, the, was producing the fabric, you know, fabric for airbag, uh, producing the airbag for Mercedes Benz or uh, Toyota brand and so on. So in that perspective, this uh, they have their own problem, you know, the industry, and we um, get that that problem from the industry. That is that was the real life problem, and we distributed to our team members, and it was very nicely uh, say solved, and we also used the six sigma project. Uh, management or execution process also. You, you may know the Six Sigma is the uh, another method where you can solve the problem, qualitative problem through uh, DMAIC, D-M-A-I-C method. So that was nicely done and they got their result very nice. And even after completing this type of um, project, 
the industry, they hired the, those students after completing their third year, you know, um, uh, that means the sixth semester, they hired them for as a part-time basis. So that problem was relevant to the fabric manufacturing, even the, you know, the sewing related problem of the airbag. In AUST, actually we have our final year project and um, our students has to go to the factory industry to do their industrial training. And during that training, actually they identify their real life problem from the industry during the, uh, from the process and they try to solve this problem as a project work. So in that way, in the short scale, we are doing our final year project now. So it has a great impact even. Even recently, we already uh, signed a contract with one of the very uh, large industry in Bangladesh, that is DBL Group. They are very much interested in to get even 30 students every semester to do this type of work in their industry. So it has a very good feedback, you know, from the industry also. Yes, agree with you. Thank you very much, Prof. Baral, for your enlightenment, okay, your explanation about this. Uh, so it's very interesting. So I am also now hearing new uh, authentic problem from you in terms of the textile industry perspective. Thank you very yeah. much. So I think, uh, Prof. Mazharul, I think we maybe we can conclude everything. Yes, please. Yes, I think. Yes, okay. Done. So, yeah. al Alhamdulillah, we have uh, successfully uh, listened uh, all four marvelous presentations from uh, Dr. Riaz, uh, Dr. Al Sheikh, and Dr. Zamri, as well as Prof. Uh, Baral. Alhamdulillah, and we we uh, would like to express our gratitude to all four of you, and then uh, particularly to uh, Prof. Mazharul for inviting all of us uh, to this um, wonderful uh, conference. Uh, uh, also, thank you to uh, Dr. Al Sheikh for being a spectacular repertoire, and also the success uh, the session coordinator, uh, Mr. Aminul Rahman. Okay, so uh, I think uh, uh, on behalf of myself and also the committee here, I would like to uh, apologize for any shortcoming. And now I would like to, uh, okay, before before I end, I would like to uh, share uh, that uh, because uh, just now Prof. Baral have mentioned about problem-based learning. So from Center for Engineering Education, okay, we also have, uh, we are going to organize a, a, a problem-based learning problem crafting workshop in Malaysia from 29, to 30, 29 September to 2nd October. So it's going to be held in Johor Bahru. So it's a four days uh, workshop to craft problem for problem-based okay. learning. Okay, so uh, I will uh, share the information later to Prof. Uh, Mazarul, inshallah. Okay, so without uh, further ado, I would like to pass the session back to, is it to Abidur Rahman or to Prof. Mazarul? Okay, I can wrap up. Uh, thank you. Okay, okay. Dr. Zaki, so thank I you pass very to Prof. much. Mazarul. Thanks to all of you. And just to, uh, I mean, let you know that tomorrow, inshallah, we'll start at 10 a.m. Uh, tomorrow we have uh, technical session number three, starting at uh, 10 a.m. And also today, inshallah, we'll have an exciting panel discussions with distinguished panel, um, expert panel members uh, from 2 to 3.30 p.m. I'm inviting all of you to join tomorrow as well. Thank you very much for your kind support. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank See you, you tomorrow. Thank you.